Pizza. Ugh. Look like Pizza the Hut. <laughs> You're delicious. <laughs> is how we start it? Yes. Yeah. Yes. God, I'm looking at myself. This is terrible. <laughs> Do the same thing. <sighs> I need to lose fifty pounds by tomorrow. <laughs> like judging from the way I look on these things, I just lost fifty pounds in that Krispy Kreme diet. <clears throat> um, welcome to the Twenty Five Eight Studios podcast. Uh, I'm Mark, and next to me is the beautiful Stacey Toy. Hi. Um, you want to talk about our guest today? Sure. Or do we want to talk about like anything else before? <laughs> You know, world this is affairs. your show. I'm just here for it. It's not my show. It's our show. <laughs> um, so last week I met um, Stacy's friend Josh. Um, he stopped by, and uh, you know we started to talk, and um, he started to tell me a story, and I and I was riveted. Um, so much so that I kicked Stacy out of the room. <laughs> he, he did. He literally, he's like, Stacy, <laughs> get out the, of the room. Let him talk. I, okay, fine. You guys have fun. And so I left. Um, it was great. <laughs> and, and I know that like at the start of this, we're giggling, but um, this whole podcast is about addiction. And um, Josh has a, a, a very, and I'm going to try not to do the stutter s- stuff so Stacy doesn't laugh. Um, you know, Josh has been through, Josh and Stacy went to high school together, correct? Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I mean, this dude's been, been to hell and back. Yeah. And, um, more than once. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's a very, I hate to use the term sobering, but, but, you know, hearing what he went through is very, is, is very sobering to listen to. And also at the same time, uh, he'll be one of the first people to admit that his story is not unique. Correct. Um, you know, Stacy and I both have, have struggled with our own demons and addiction. And, you know, thankfully we're in, we're in a place where we can be quasi active members of society. Um, we kind of do what we enjoy doing and that would never have been possible if we're, if we were still doing the things that we thought we enjoyed. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it's, it's very, it's very hard to kind of convey in two hours, you know, what addiction is, what it means, what it does, um, to you, what it does to your family, what it does to your finances, what it does to your kids, what it does to your friends, what it does to the people that care about you. Um, so we, we, I mean, we kind of try to do our best and, and, you know, any, anybody who struggles with addiction or has struggled with addiction, um, I, I, I've always come from the point of view where you, you shouldn't be ashamed of it Mm -hmm. where you shouldn't look at it as like, you know, this, you know, this checkbox and the negative of your life. I think it's a, for some people, um, it's incredibly cathartic. Mm-hmm. Um, for them to realize what the important things are in life, and unfortunately, unfortunately, and in, in for for reasons that we can all debate about um, whether or not this is the reason why, or whether or not it isn't. But but you know, opioids and heroin right now are are taking some of the kindest, smartest, um, selfless people in our country, and I don't know if we're doing enough about it, I don't know if we're thinking enough about it. I don't know if we care enough about it because there's this stigma, um, for, for people, especially in the opioid heroin world where they're not looked upon as, as human beings, um, for people, from people who don't understand and the majority of the population really doesn't understand pop uh, addiction or else, you know, our country would have 300 million people in rehab and they'd all get it. And so we'd all stop. Um, it's a vicious disease. Um, and Josh tries to elaborate it on it a lot about like what it means just to give it perspective for people who don't understand. Um, it, it's starting to really bother me that, um, you know, I, 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 I do, the video for coaches versus cancer every year. And one of the questions that they ask is, you know, they start off going, 
you know, who, who here has a family member who has cancer and, you know, you know, 10% of the room lifts, lifts their hand up. Um, you know, who here has, who here knows somebody who has cancer and the whole room stands up, Mm -hmm. um, heroin and opioids are starting to become the same thing, the same thing. Mm -hmm. Um, so I I think, you know, in the conversation that I had last week with Josh, cause I mean, he's a, he seems very private. Um, so for him to do this is, is monumental. Mm -hmm. And I hope, uh, to anyone who's listening, who has either a, has a family member or a friend who's suffering from addiction or has lost a family member or a friend from addiction, you know, just know that you're, you're not alone. Mm -hmm. Um, and that there is hope. There's no such thing as hopelessness in this. Um, but I mean, collaboratively, like I mentioned to you just before, the three of us, you, me, and Josh, you know, collaboratively have like 25 years of sobriety between the three of us so far to the point. Um, but so that's, far. But the thing is, is we're here and we're talking about it because a lot of the people that you know, we're with us on our journey, no longer are. Um, yeah, I've lost of, quite a few friends. Ever, you have? I yeah. mean, I lost, you know, my husband, he's lost his, you know, child's mother as well. I mean, like, and, and brother, I mean, it's it's not just friends, it's like serious hit home, like, you know, death. Just Yeah, this isn't this isn't something that, and, you know, and, and, and Josh says it in the podcast tonight, and I want everyone, I want everyone to understand this. This is not something that happens outside this community. This is something that is currently happening in this community and it's not getting better. Mm -hmm. I want everyone to understand that there's a severity here that, you know, to me, uh, we can argue about, you know, gun control, education, you know, 10,000 other topics that are not doing as much damage as this is doing right now. And that's not, to denigrate or besmirch anyone who suffered anything of those, you know, stereotypical things that I, that I said, I mean, I mean, tragedy is tragedy regardless of how it happens. Um, this is one of those things that's preventable, I think with, with education, um, and love. Mm -hmm. We help each other. Yeah. And I think if you have those two things, then there's, there's, there's a way out. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I don't know. The, I, for some reason, this open is really like affecting me. <laughs> well, that well then, if it affects yeah. you and this is your thing we're putting out, then then it's got to do something for yeah. It just I, I just everybody else. Usually, like I'm bubbly and like this is it, but it, it's, it's hard. just it just really it just really it just really bothers me. And I and I and you know to be absolutely honest, I I don't think federally, um, locally especially government. I mean, I mean, Josh is a success story going through treatment court, but I, 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 I just don't think we're doing enough. And I don't think that we're doing enough with prevention and education and, you know, people like Josh put him in a room and, and have him talk to, you know, young kids or something. You know, I, I, I don't know if he aspires to do that, but um, to honestly talk about, drug abuse and and what it does and and how it and how it you know destroys lives families and you know unfortunately sometimes leads to death and you know mm-hmm. i don't want to live in that world anymore i know we don't so i don't want people to suffer anymore i don't either uh, want to go to the intro let's get to the intro all right We just docked. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I snorted. Do you know what docking don't do is? That. Do you know no, what don't tell is? her. Don't. She knows. She knows. <laughs> all right, all right. She knows. <laughs> I didn't know until about a year ago, and then I found out. <laughs> and then you were, and then you were, and then you were like, "Oh, it, yeah, that's oh, good. All right, I can use this in a sentence. Never. Yeah, heard. yeah. <laughs> Thank God for the Urban Dictionary. Um. All right, so. <laughs> 
So good, good way to start a conversation. I don't know talking, what talking, talking I mean, about docking. <laughs> well, I don't like. To, I mean, we can always cut it, but I don't know if people want to have the first sixty seconds being about docking. <laughs> um, you know, like space shuttles. We're all um, about being informative. Yeah, the ISS. We want to have. Yeah, if you don't know what that is. Um, so um, we're here. With a with a gentleman who I met, um, what was it about a week ago? Yeah. Um, and uh, of course, everyone's friends with Stacy. Sorry, so, I, I, sorry. She's um, a people person. Do you do you uh, do you want to? So so Josh is here to talk about um, something that you know Stacy and I at least have experience with, and and that is in addiction. Um, so I don't think, and the other thing too is like when I start going up, 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 like Stacy loses her mind. I know. We she thinks discussing. it's the funniest thing ever where I can't find words. It's mixed master Marky. <laughs> yeah. It sounds like, it's not, yeah, it sounds like you're at some it's the like, remix. yeah, it sounds like you're in Spain at like some sort of rave. <laughs> with no music. If you pull out the beat, um, so we're here to talk about addiction. We're here to talk about addiction from a, from from Josh's personal standpoint, which is, um, I, you know, correct me if I'm wrong. You know, everybody's addiction is different. Everybody's everybody how they handle it, what they go through, who they're with, is is it's very it's all like snowflakes, man. And the, no 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 two experiences are usually alike. Not not normally, but the one thing you do find is that uh, people's backgrounds and some of the stories are the same as far as how they got started what happened how they got into it and what they ended up at the end what the consequences were all right so let's let's start at the beginning when there was dinosaurs and then they died and then they made oil and then the arabs came nobody airplane nobody nothing you never saw airplane? I did. I did. Oh, it's the greatest little line there. Um, <laughs> so where did so where did you grow up? Did you grow up with Stacy? I didn't grow up with her, but we did end up going to school together. Um, I grew up from here, a little town, like 15 miles away from here, Lake Ariel. Um, oh, L.A. Yeah, yes. L.A. The, 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 <laughs> mean, the mean streets of L.A. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A little bit different, but yeah. Um, now we live in a house pretty much in the middle of nowhere. Um, neighbors are like half a mile away. You don't have anybody bothering you. Um, as far as like me do you growing, have brothers and sisters. I do. I have an older brother. Um, I'll talk about in a little bit when we get to that part. Right. I have a twin sister. And are you, uh, are you guys identical or is it fraternal? It's fraternal. A she. Yeah. Okay. And then I also have a younger brother that's ten years younger than we are. So there's four kids. In there's the family. four of us total. Yeah. And mom and dad were both parents. Both there the whole time. Um, still together now. They've been together since they were like 17 years old. So now they lived up there too, right? They, my mom grew up in Dunmore. My father grew up like two miles from where our house is now on the lake. Oh, so and he didn't want to move for? No, he didn't. No. <laughs> <laughs> if you go up that way and you know any anybody from our family, they pretty much stay in that area, like within a 10 mile radius. They're all right there. Um, is that microphone sliding down? Hey, you want me to pick it up? Yes, yeah, slide. Yeah, tighten it. All those knobs, even the one right here, on the on the outer side. Pretty pretty soon you're gonna be working here. <laughs> Righty tighty, lefty loosey. So so did so you went to school up there. So like, what's what's the age difference between you and your and your brothers and sisters? Like um, what like what's the oldest? What's the youngest? My oldest brother would be almost 38 now. Uh, me and my sister are just turned 36, and my little brother. Not little, but little to me is 27 now. I always like the elderly people who are in their 80s going, looking at 60 year old people and going like those kids. <laughs> <laughs> I always thought that was funny. Um, so what, what, like, what was childhood like? Was childhood like normal or was it? We didn't have psycho a bad, or no, not at all. We didn't have a bad childhood growing up. We didn't. Not that we were well off, but we weren't by any means poor either. Right. What, so like middle class. Middle class. Yeah. What we, you know, what we wanted, we usually ended up getting. My parents pretty much provided us with yeah, whatever. Yeah, like, I want a Lamborghini, and, and Dad's like, here you go. No, no, but when we did turn 16, all of us, my dad bought us cars when we turned 16. So it's not like shoes and stuff for school, no problems. Like, we had everything that we needed growing up. So, so it's, not like, it's not like it was it was, it was was troubled times. 
No, not at all. Um, I mean, my parents had, you know, a fight here and there, but... Well, every parent who, does I, that. What household don't, and if anyone tells me anything different... They're, they're lying. lying anyway. <laughs> yeah, <it's>, Absolutely. <laughs> every household fights. It doesn't matter where you are. But um, no, other than that, we, we've had a pretty normal childhood. I got nothing to complain about. I mean, were you, I mean, did you, did you, was there like an age, my age of being, starting to become an ass hat was right around like 13. <laughs> Honestly, in high school, I was like straight A's. Like I strive to really do the so, best wait, I, I mean, could. was it spo- like, were you like a great student in I, sports and in both? I did all of it. Like I played every sport possible at every time I wrestled. I played basketball. Football was my number one thing that I did. I played from second grade all the way up until college or college. Now, now high school, where'd you go to high school? Uh, Western Wayne. Okay. And they have like three elementary schools. Mm-hmm. I ended up in Robert. Is that D. where one of the green ones is? Evergreen. Yes. Yeah, okay. Evergreen. Okay. That's where the one now. goes to. Yeah. Gotcha. yeah. That's what my kids go to. But, um, yeah, I played every sport and then any like, I mean, were clubs. you a bench warmer or were you good? No, I was good. That's the thing. Like, I <laughs> football, I was really good. I was small, you play? but I was fast. Wide receiver. And then I played safety on defense. I played both sides. They always put the wide receiver at safety. I, I know, because you got to be quick. And yeah, you, you're the just in case, but we don't want you to get hurt. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I would, I would throw my body around the field like it didn't matter. And I was, at that point, like, there's um, weight limits in each class. And, like, they wouldn't even put me on a scale. They're like, Psh. yeah, like, okay, bud. Right. So, but I would actually, like, come, like from the safety position, if a back was coming up, I would fly up to the line and smack people. Like, I didn't care. And that was all, like, 60 pounds of me at the time. 60, with the pads on. <laughs> with everything. Fully clothed, yeah. Helmet, so it, shoulder pads, everything. So is that where you met Stacy? Because I know ne- because we've never had anybody on who can give us context to Stacy years ago. Oh, okay. See, I mean, this, this, is, <laughs> yeah, this is all a this, trap. I know. I know <laughs> why, trap. Now I know why you asked him to be on the show. Yeah, as soon as I week. talked to him, I looked at like, you and I was like, you my brain be, started you going. You should be on the show. It's him. <laughs> all right. <laughs> yeah, but it's true. Surprise! Not about you, Josh. Ja. It's about Stacy. <laughs> I'll um, pay you later. Be nice. <laughs> what was what was Stacy like in high school? I actually I didn't really meet her until we got into high school. Cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then um, one of my friends actually met her first. And I don't really know the first time I met her, but I know the first time I seen her, I was like, wow, she's really cute. Okay. And uh, no one has ever said that about me, by the way. Uh, <laughs> <Keep going. laughs> After Except for that, my blind fiance. <laughs> she's got Coke bottle glasses, man. <laughs> it's all that counts as long as someone thinks it. Yeah. Don't matter. Yeah. Um, no, she started hanging out with some of the people that I started hanging out with. And uh, we ended up just in the same clique. And, uh, I think we took SAT prep there. together, right? Probably. Because I think your sister and you were in the same class. Because it was like one of the only classes where we can mix match. Where are you going, dude? Just keep going. All right. <laughs> that was probably, <laughs> yeah. High school was about it. But really, I didn't, I focused on school more than anything at that point. I mean, were you like, how did they, how did they judge like your academic performance? Was it like a GPA or was it like an overall like percentage average or cause when you say like yeah. you were, you were getting A's and stuff like it, yeah, it was, but I don't know where, I mean, were you like there was a only like a student or well, there's only close. seven in your class. There, there's only like 115 yeah. kids we graduated. So Pretty it's much. not like there was a lot there, but so like, was, so like freshman through senior year, I mean, what were your grades like straight A's the whole time? You're kidding me. Straight no. A's. Yeah. Not a B anywhere. Maybe in like ninth or tenth grade, I might have had one, but after that, what class that, would that B no. have been in? Uh, English, if anything, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Your native tongue. <laughs> yeah. Yep. <laughs> yes. Yeah, math, science, I'm pretty good, but um, math, science, party killed. You killed it. Killed it. Yeah. Killed it. I'm so and jealous I, of math, and I still oh. do. It's not that I liked it. I was always good at it, so I just kept doing it, even into college too. See, now I when I went to high when I went when I was in high school, I did uh, I, I pre algebra was in in I did pre algebra in ninth grade. Me too, algebra. Um, and I got I think a fifty. Nice, better yeah. than a forty nine. Better. <laughs> and then the following year, I took geometry and I got a ninety nine point nine in that class. Geometry for some reason just connected with me and it was it was great but it brought all my other grades up which was great um and then i went to algebra 
which I did terrible in, and trigonometry, we don't even want to talk about. Trig was 11th, <laughs> and then calculus. Yeah, tri- like trigonometry two. was the one where I was like, I could do work study, <laughs> so I'm going to leave at noon and not do my trigonometry class. Well, trig, you start getting into um, not was it numbers calculus anymore. Trig? But Maybe it was calculus I'm talking about. <laughs> I <laughs> didn't even know what we're talking about. Yeah, I don't even know. <laughs> well, so, trig, you start getting into sine, cosine, and yeah, you yeah, don't yeah, have yeah, numbers yeah. so much anymore. And that was like, all... Phew, yeah. yeah, yeah, that went over. That was like that was like an eagle going over my head. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. I was Catch, good like, at there's it. There's a rabbit behind me. I didn't even make it to the class, so um, you're better off than me. <laughs> so I mean, but but also at that time, you know, I I I, I, I think I I first got introduced. <clears throat> the first time I was drunk was, uh, I think it was seventh grade. I remember my first cigarette. My first cigarette was December twenty fourth, nineteen eighty nine. Wow! I remember. Not, I remember not that. counting or anything. Wait. I just remember. No, because I because so I was that's at a, like seven. You were seven. Eighteen eighty nine. So I was nine. Nine. Yeah. See, I can add two. So I mean, but I really didn't start like inhaling until like fifteen. It was more like the candy cigarettes. That's how you would treat it. Um, and then one day I was like, "What happens if I?" And then I was like, <laughs> "But if I keep doing it, I'll still be cool." So this is like, you know, the early 90s when you think, you know, everything, the grunge is out, every, you know, Kurt Cobain smoking, you know, all that shit. Um, and then uh, I, you know, I, I found pot and pot. The thing about pot was, is that pot uh, would always give me a panic attack. So every time I got stoned, I'd have to get rushed to the hospital. <laughs> and I don't You're oh, the oh no my God, fun. You know what? I never. I, I, the I, no I, fun friend. Yeah. But I never realized that right now might be the first time that my parents actually found out that every time they rushed me to the ER in the middle of the night was because I was stoned. Um, hey, Mark and Kath. Um, but I loved alcohol, man. I loved it. I thought it was, I thought it was the best. I thought it was, it, 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 and when they say like liquid courage and all that, like I, it, it was so appropriate for me. Um, high school, it absolutely was. I was the kid in high school that because I was doing sports, every time I heard like, "Oh, we're smoking weed or smoke, smoking pot," I'm like, "Yeah, I ain't doing that." Like, there's no, but we're no gonna, way get a, we're gonna get a case of Keystone. But yeah, like yeah. we're gonna yeah throw a kegger tonight, and I'm all right with that. But um, as far as even smoking, like I wouldn't even do that, and that really didn't happen yeah, I, until I, my I, senior year in high school. I tried. I just couldn't. I just couldn't do it. You know. Yeah, but he was in sports too, so like the 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 piss tests that randomly could have come which I don't even know if they ever did in them ever they never drug tested I know but they always like held it over your head and like if it was something that you loved you know well I remember I remember actually going to like the football games for Abington and I'd be there smoking cigarettes at the football (laughs) games for Abington um thinking it was the 70s we had a dirt (laughs) track for track and field at high school, they just recently changed it to uh, so an actual you're all rubber running track. In dust. And, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> pretty much. Like you Trying see, not cheerlead in that is like insane. I mean, we never won a game, anyways. Sorry. Yeah, but at the end of the but. night, but at the end of the night, your mouth is caked in mud, <laughs> not dirt. <laughs> pretty much. Um, so, so I mean, both of you, like, when did you both start like experimenting or you know? having your first drink or any of that stuff. Stace, if you don't want to answer, you can leave. No, um, no, I'm good. I'm good. I just didn't, you know, know this is going to be about me too, but that's okay. I'm, I'm down. You hashtag. Know? Hashtag. Go ahead, Josh. So, so you, just you, spent most of your, you just spent most of your high school time drinking. I got, drinking I until got, senior year. Yeah, I got a lot of uh, into some things actually unknowingly through the help of Josh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, friends do things what, together, what right? I wish. <laughs> Why couldn't that? Why couldn't you have taught me how to add? Like, no, I'm just kidding. I mean, what were the things? What were the things up at the up in that school district at the time? Because we only basically had pot and, and booze, and that was it. Like, there was no cocaine, there was no heroin, there was no. I didn't really go looking for anything else. I'm sure there. Well, neither was. did I. It was just happened to be there. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm sure there was, but as far as for me, it was pretty much weed and and drinking through through high school at least. Mm-hmm. And a few times there was uh I mean, would you do like every weekend or would you do like once a month or would you do drinking? We drank on the weekends. Yeah. Without a doubt. Yeah. Friday, Smoking, Saturdays. I only did it here and there even. Yeah. Friday, Saturday. Do you have games? Friday night after a football game. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. That's what we do. Um, the thing is where we live, there's, there's nothing to do. We live in the middle of the woods. So there's not very many. It's not like you can go to like two cops too. 
Yeah. I don't even think we had two cops. We didn't even have a police force then. So. <laughs> no, it's true. <laughs> Some guy named Cliff. If that any, old. Yeah, if anything <laughs> happened, it was the state police coming from Honesdale, which, you know, they take like an hour and a half to get to where we are anyway. So everything's <laughs> yeah, set so up time done to walk we're gone. from the party. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, where, 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 so, I mean, was it, was it a problem? It wasn't a problem because it was never a problem for me in high school. It was never something that was like, I need to get stoned today or I need to go drinking today. It's just like it was it was either just boredom or like everyone else was. It That's was what the, I was, was saying. Sheer, sheer boredom is what brought everybody to do it because there there's literally nothing. There's nothing to do unless you drive 45 minutes to get to anywhere. But so besides you, that, there's there's nothing. Did you guys mm-hmm. did you guys party together? Occasionally. Yeah. Once a, a bunch of our friends ended up getting like a house um, down in Green like Ridge. Green Ridge area, yeah. Like an that apartment. Was like, yeah, like the whole yep. house though. So it was like the place everybody went because I was still underage for sure when that happened. I think I was just getting ready to go to college. It was like my last. And the landlords were Hoorah. not happy, or I don't even know if they were I, living <laughs> around here to be honest with you. Because if, if they did, were, they I don't yeah, even know. they definitely didn't care. <laughs> I mean, what, what year is what, what? Right around what year is this? I mean, when they got a house, that, that I'm assuming you guys are out of high school by then. It was 2000, 2001, because mm-hmm. I just started college at that point. And I was a senior, because he's one year ahead of me. So where'd you go to college? So I applied and ended up at Temple University in good Philadelphia. School, and I ended up, I started off as um, an electrical and computer engineering. Stayed there for two years and uh, just absolutely hated Philadelphia. <laughs> Philadelphia? Yes. Philadelphia. Well, now, if I'm not mistaken, like... When at Temple, and this is what I've heard, is that like if you're on campus, it's good, but the surrounding area is just very like anywhere around it is have a gun pretty rough. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's not not a good area to be in it at all. Um, anywhere south of it, anywhere going towards Center City isn't too bad. Going south of Temple's campus, not really the greatest area in the world. So how how'd you do? How were you doing like the first two years? So my big thing was sports coming out of high school. When I got to college. And I was like five foot six, 120 pounds. Right. And My some dog of these guys. more than you. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was then. But um, yeah, some of these guys that are playing college football are like six six, two fifty, 250, and they're just like stacked diesel. I'm yeah, like, it's like getting hit by a Ford Fiat. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, no, I'm not killing myself. So. Well, you didn't have like an academic scholarship or anything, did you? I didn't. I got scholarships like locally for, right. you know, a few hundred here and there, but right. nothing. Nothing major. So how did, like I said, how did the, how was, how was the first two years? I mean, were you, were you, did you, did, were I, you getting A's? Uh, no, we'll, we'll say I mean, no. Was that one of those things where it's like, all right, you're leaving the country and now you're going to like a metropolis. So that was a big thing too, was I grew up in Lake Ariel, which is, you know, a population of 17, 12 of them being my family. <laughs> and... <laughs> Move straight to from my parents' house right to the middle of Philadelphia. So culture shock was a big thing right. because it's like I think there's 32 or 34,000 students enrolled at Temple. Wow. So just in that tiny confined space in Philly, you have a lot of kids and a lot of stuff happening at once. So that was a big shock and something to get adjusted to. Um, that took a little while. But is there like a fear of fitting in or, you know? Absolutely. Because here... In, in high school, it was, you know, no one's going to make fun of me because I'm just going to do whatever you're doing and doing it better. Right. And you have no reason to say anything to me because I'm doing it better than you. Period. Right. College, no. Like I said, there's kids that are 6'6", 250, running the 40 the same time as I am, just as fast as me. Wow. And it was just not, not for me. So sports stopped pretty much when I got to college. Um there wasn't a lot to do. I ended up pledging a fraternity, uh, Teak Tau Kappa Epsilon, and uh, I just needed to pay for friends. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I needed something to do. Stop. So I ended well, up. Well, the moment you're there, you're like, par- that's a party. Oh, it is. Well, yeah. you have all these kids again in one little space, and that's what everybody does: is party all day long. How was pledging? Was that crazy? Pledging was interesting. Uh, we did a lot of. Um, I don't need details because I know there's some sort of <laughs> oath. a lot of diff- yeah. yeah a lot of different stuff. Um, <clears throat> but I mean, I, did you do like that binge drinking shit and we all had that? we had something at the end called Hell Weekend where for a couple of days straight um, that's pretty much all we did and 
oddly enough, where we went for Hell Weekend, they're like, you know, they blindfolded us. They put us in a van. They're like, we're taking you to somewhere. You'll never know where you're at. And we ended up coming here. And I'm like, this is my backyard. Like, I know exactly where I am. <laughs> like, I'm looking at Montage Mountain across the hill. And I'm like, I know where we're at. Like, okay. So, yeah. yeah was, did you guys read my bio before <laughs> I pledged? <laughs> I told funny. you guys where I'm from. Yeah, but we ended up right across from Montage, so... <laughs> But we'd have East Mountain or West Mountain. You were over like in Taylor. Stare, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Old Ford. That's just, so random. Who the, who the, well, the, the that Penn State, those Penn State one. Remember, they brought people out past Stroudsburg and that's where that hazing incident happened. I wonder how many other people bring people here. You know, that kid that died. Well, I mean, we, I mean, we know, we know how to drink. <laughs> They're like the Pope. North East knows, knows how to drink. Yes. Man. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So what happened after two years? Like, why'd you get out of Temple? Um, I didn't like Philly, but I ended up, my grandmother lived in Lakeland, Florida, which is just outside of Orlando. I know exactly because I used to live in Orlando. Okay. So you know where Lakeland oh, yeah. is. I went to see her and she's like, you know, there's a college right down the road. And I'm like, well, let me go look at it. And I went and looked at- What college was it? Florida Southern. I don't know that one. It's right on Lake Hollingsworth. That's a private- I went to Full Sail. Full Sail? Yeah. Okay. Which is over in Winter Park. Okay. We used to party in Orlando. <laughs> we used to go downtown. I think it was Orange Orange Ave or something like that. I'm not too familiar. Like where with all the skyscrapers that. are like, well, Florida's versions of skyscrapers. We were down there just losing our minds. We'd go to emo <laughs> bars and stuff. It was crazy. Like we go there and they're all they're playing is like Morrissey and The Cure. And I'm like, I don't like this. Oh, drink specials are good. Yeah. You never went down and walked Ebor City. No, never and went just, down to Ebor. No, no, just no. walked the strip. There's tons of bars, restaurants, like any type of music you could ever want. I spent most of my time everything. in Orlando trying to find a bar that reminded me of Scranton. Really? We finally found two. See, yeah. I got out of Scranton to forget Scranton. <laughs> no, I just I just love the atmosphere of a Scranton bar. Like, you know, it's just like there's something like down and dirty about it and just the backwoods. Yeah, I remember so there's this one bar that we found and it was like it was like literally like one of those tucked away like you know, old dead palm leaf, palm tree leaves like everywhere. I mean, it, it, for, if I didn't know any better, it's a biker bar. And the thing about Florida, there's a I, lot down there. Yeah, the thing about Florida that I didn't realize was that when you order a shot, it's like it's like in a highball glass. Because I'm used to like the one ounce, like clang, you're done. <clears throat> so this guy, this guy gave me. I, I so I walked into the bar and I said, I'd like a Miller Light and a shot of Jack Daniels. And I said, but I want the one ounce shot. I want the shot glass, <laughs> not like the big. You know, rocks glass that you guys usually give that has like five ounces. Not the jumbo cup from yeah, 7 Eleven. Don't want it. You know, <laughs> just give me a one ounce shot glass. Like a shot glass you see in every <laughs> everywhere else in the world. <laughs> so I remember that, and this guy was like totally like, you know, cut off uh, jean jacket, you know, big beard. And he got me my drinks, put my shot down, and I don't know how he did it. But he spun a tampon into the shot glass. What? Because I asked for less liquor. Oh. <laughs> so he spun it and it landed perfect into the shot glass. And I was like, anyone else would probably be offended by this, but that was pretty funny and pretty awesome. <laughs> it definitely. Is. Yeah. So I, I wrung it out. And oh my it God. <laughs> I mean, but that's how that's how like crazy it is, you know? Because like we would, I mean, we would we 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 were the guys who would drink till seven o'clock in the morning. Like that's what we wanted to do. You know, and then not too I, many when bars I come, you walk into and get a tampon thrown in your thing. So no, I'll, yes. it's, one, it's one of those things that no matter how <laughs> drunk I was that night, I will never forget. But that how was many such people the best. would bring it out and drink it? That's <laughs> that's the other side. The of guy it. who didn't want to, who didn't want to let this guy know that he got to me. <laughs> So, I mean, I mean, that's, that's what incredible. we did. We got tuned up and then we went and then, you know, I'd come back here to visit and, you know, you just, I, I was a great, like I'd go to, I'd go to nickel draft night and have a bar tab of $150. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like psycho stuff. Um, so where, so, so, so is late, what happens in Lakeland? You know, honestly, I, I did a little bit here and there in Lakeland. Um, like drinking? Drinking, smoking, but, um you know cocaine here and there far and few in between like if people were doing it and we were at the bar 
you know, it was what it was, but it's not I would like just something I would search and for. keep drinking. A lot of people do, and that's what yeah. I mean. If we were at the bar and someone had it, but it's not something yeah, that I would Yeah, I'm not I like, it's 9 a.m., here's the eggs, can I have some cocaine? It was just, it was <clears> so we can stay up drinking till the sun came up. So it ended up being that um, I moved out to Tampa, Clearwater, and I was commuting to college every day. Isn't that like um, a, an hour and a half drive? Yeah, it's like an hour. Um, mm. But I ended up going to school during the day, and I was working telemarketing at night from 6 to 12. Oh, that's terrible. Uh, yeah, it was pretty terrible. But it was decent money, so I did it. Um, <clears throat> but at that place, everyone was doing pills then. Everyone was taking Roxy's, Oxy's, Perks, Vikes, any type of painkiller. At pain the killer. telemarketing place. Absolutely. How many employees are there? A lot. Three rooms with like 30 to 40 people in each one. And you'd one. say that most of them were? Absolutely. Definitely. Like, you don't say that without any sarcasm whatsoever. Not one bit at all. Even the managers, even the people that own the place, literally everybody. And if you... killers. Yeah. And, and at that time in Florida, they were huge. There was pill mills everywhere down there. And I mean, to the point where to get ours, um, we ended up... I did. I went on and I actually made my own MRI saying that I had problems with my back. Took it to one of these places. Get out of here. I was like, Doc, my quality of life is diminished. I got a kid, um, which I didn't even have at the time. I'm like, I can't even play with him on the weekends. <laughs> my gosh. Like, I can't pick him up. Um, I can't do anything. And he's I mean, like, Do you think at that moment you're in the throes of addiction? It was starting then for sure, okay. without a doubt. All right, so then you keep saying to your doctor <laughs> yeah, <laughs> about your I, fictional child. I, yeah, I'm like, with I, a fictional I can't do uh, MRI. <laughs> with an MRI that I made myself. And he's like, okay, well, um, we could we could definitely help you out. And we'll see about, you know, surgery, you know, down the road if this don't help. And he writes me a script for 320 Roxy 30s and 180 Oxy 80s a month a at the month. time. A month. A month. So that kept up for... So that's 480 painkillers a month. And At least you're prescribed that's for That's enough to basically kill a horse, pretty much. <laughs> okay. So before that, before I went to him, I was taking like, you know, a half a day, one a day. And yeah. then I started... You're rationing. Seeing, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, conserving <laughs> money. And then I started seeing him and it was like... A, a buffet, a, a smorkish board, if you will. You know what I mean? There was just... It was. I mean, did you walk out of that doctor's appointment going like, "Holy!" Jumping up and down. Oh, really? Yeah, I was like, "This is sweet." So now, now explain to me, like, why are you jumping up and down? Because I had, you know, five hundred pills. But what was to but take what was it about it? Like, what was, what it, was ab it about taking them? Yeah, what was it about taking In them? In the that beginning, when I took them, I got so much energy. Like, I could go all day long, talk on the phone all night, go to school during the day. Never got, was there any loopy? Were you ever like, no, not at all. Like, I was a functioning Pill addict. addict, if you will. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It was, it was nice in the beginning. But, but then, now you have 380 a month, which boils down to what? Over 10 a day. Yeah, and actually, it got to the point eventually at where least at, at I least was at running that prescription. out. Right, I was running out and having to buy them to fill me over until my next appointment. Which then, I met a girl, Nicole, at the telemarketing place I was working at. I was a manager, and she was one of the employees in my room. Which then, at twenty five, I just graduated college. Um, with a degree in... I got my degree in computer science with a minor in math. Okay. Was able to hold like everything together. Like real smart shit. Yeah. It, pretty much, yeah. I like how you less. shrug. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what I was saying about the math. Like, it... Not that I liked it. I could do it, and it was easy to me. So I just kept doing it through college because I, I could do it. And it actually... I, I shouldn't say it wasn't bad. Like, I, I did enjoy it. Um, with computer science, though, I had to take 15 credits of high-level math anyway. You only need 18 in a subject to minor, so I ended up taking uh, one extra class and got the minor in it. Oh, nice. Um, but after college, then, with this girl, I hooked her up with an MRI, hooked her up with a doctor. She was going. She was getting the same exact prescription I was. So we were getting double. At different doctors? Same one. She was going two weeks after I was. Get the fuck. So we were getting like almost a thousand a month at that point. 
Um, I just had my now. F- just just so everyone knows, OxyContin is usually for people who have like stage four cancer. Absolutely. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And just Strong. also, who's who's the who's the pharmaceutical company behind that? Uh, it's Purdue, I believe, isn't it? And I and if I'm not mistaken, they've been they've been fined over three billion dollars for false advertising since. <laughs> so it's funny you brought that up because I actually watched something on Netflix about them when right. they came out with this medication when they were pitching it to forming. doctors yep. they said 98 percent of people that take this medication will not become addicted to it and if you look at it now i don't know what the exact number is but i guarantee I anyone it's... that takes it more than two months even a month is addicted to it so the numbers are like flipped they're completely <laughs> probably 98 percent of the people who took it can't get, get off of it yes get addicted yeah. yep well because because i'm i'm bringing this up so that we can get to the history of like kind of give a small microscopic point of view of like where we are in america today that's like that's my end goal of of this whole conversation if right. that makes sense yep so a little bit of history a little bit of personal you know, get a, getting a, getting us to where we like understand the pandemic that's happening. So in Florida at that time, anybody could basically go and get a, any type of prescription like that. All you had to do was tell them, you know, you're injured, you had an injury, whatever, and they would just throw you stuff. Um, it's a little bit different now. It's a lot harder to get. And I think that's where a lot of the problems are coming in is that people are getting addicted to them. And then the doctors are cutting them off or they're going well, to jail. Well, right, let's get to that because I have. OK. OK. So you're you're now. A thousand. Oh, what? A thousand pills a month with you and your mm-hmm. friend. Or were you dating her at the time? I was. We actually had uh, my son together. Oh, OK. So I while, had my son while that, doing this. Oh, yeah. I had my son when I was 25. He was born April. Actually, well, I just met. He's lovely. Yeah, you just met him today. Yeah, he's funny. He's cute. Now, <laughs> coincidentally, um, I'm a twin, and my son was also born on my birthday. That's my so crazy. Birthday. So there's. So you get shit for your birthday. I, I don't have a birthday anymore. <laughs> no. no. All right, so wait. How? So how soon into? How soon into this? You know, getting 380 pills a month times two. Are 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 you now starting to be like this? Isn't enough. Uh, right, right around when my son came, it wasn't enough. Even with uh, Nicole going to the doctor, also, right, it wasn't even enough for both of us because we were running out and again having to buy them by the end of the month to hold us over until one of us went again. So we were doing a lot. We were getting rid of a lot, and I mean we were making a lot of money, so we were just buying more to hold us over. But um, at that point, it was bad enough that. I was leaving Florida to move back to here with my son to get clean, to right. try it. Now, what year is this? Uh, this was 2000. Well, he was born in seven, so it was 2008 because he was one at the time. So you came back here to try to kick it. I moved back here. Um, I moved behind my parents, and Nicole ended up staying in Florida. So it was me and Aiden that came back. Um, I went to a rehab Actually, it was a detox in Wilkes-Barre General at the time. I detoxed for five days. Um, they gave me a Suboxone taper. It, it was bad until I went to the detox and they gave me Suboxone for the first five days. Right. But even after that, for a good three to four weeks, I was still feeling it. I was sh- still getting the shakes, chills. But I actually happened to stop for a while. Um it was just me and Aiden. I ended up getting a job at the Army Depot in Toby Hanna. Yeah. And uh, a couple kids that I went to school with ended up working there as well. And I started talking to another kid again, and he had Vikes. And I'm like, oh, you know, I take a couple here and there. And that just train wrecked from there. Um, so now what year is this? So you get, so, you, 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 you so get sober I, for a little bit in 2008. I was, and I was sober till probably uh, 2011, I would say, for for quite a while. For That's a pretty good run. A good good year and a half, I'll just say. Right. Two years. Um, then I started taking those again, and so. But but also, what's happening with you and your son? Are you getting along? Are you you know? I absolutely. Mean, is, it was it, just me and him. So it was. <laughs> well, and your parents. You live behind your parents. I did, and and they also they they were helping out a lot at that that point too. Um, I ended up meeting another no. Nicole that I went to school with, 
who you, ended up you, moving. You to, need to lose that letter out of the I, alphabet. Dude, you have no idea how many times I had this conversation. If I meet any so, girl that's so, named Nicole, so I am is, hightailing So it. is Aiden's mom still in Florida, <laughs> even still up so, until 2011? She is, and she never came around. She never called him. She never sent him anything. She never helped out. I never went after her for child support. Um, nothing like that. She is, just is, she just didn't have any communication with him whatsoever. Is, is there is there any time in that time period where you're like, you know, and I'm assuming she's in active addiction at that time. Yeah. Yep. Is there any time that you're like, that, where that at least gives you perspective where you're like, I'm not going back to that at all ever. For a while I did say that. I said I would never go back to it again after going through withdrawal the first time. Yeah. I'm like, there's no way it's happening. But then when I found that kid that had the Vikes, I was like, well, you know, I could take a few here and there and everything will be all right. That led to, again, you know, every week to every day to waking up and I'm like, well, shit, I'm if I don't have it, then I'm going to go through withdrawal again. And I to function, to go to work, I have to have it. So then I kept having to find him again. So, I mean, now it gets to a point where it's it's like, you know, and that was like my last four weeks of, of drinking was, you know, I was never the guy that woke up in the morning drinking. And I was like, all right, I got to I gotta get up and drink so I don't have like the shakes and I'm not. I had to to function. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's another byproduct of of being an addiction is, is like, I don't think people realize that like for you to even like, you get to a point where you, for, for you to even function, you need it. You can't do anything. You don't even want to get out of bed without it. You can't, you can't do anything. You have the shakes, you have the chills, you explain that to me, explain. Cause I've never, I've never had that. So can you explain to me of what withdrawal is like? Yeah. Of like, of like <clears throat> what that, what that feels like, like put me in the, perspective of that of like you treat will, me like an ignorant idiot which you i will am lay in a bed you will put the covers on because you're freezing cold two seconds later you're sweating head to toe and you rip the covers off because you're uncomfortable can't lay on your right side can't lay on your left side and your head's pounding any sounds around you bother you ache every bone in your body hurts your legs start jumping all over the place it feels like you spires like you get are spasms crawling on you stuff? oh yeah people will tell you they get um rls restless leg syndrome yeah like crazy like they'll just have their legs out and they'll just start going crazy so so you feeling spiders on you yeah people say um i didn't but i know a lot of people say it feels like spiders are crawling all over them like they'll start scratching their arms and legs and I didn't have that personally. For me, it was the cold sweats. I couldn't get comfortable to save my life. Too hot, too cold. I couldn't find a, a midpoint. I mean, does it? I mean, so for people who've never experienced this, like, is it like the worst flu ever, or the flu times thirty? Yeah, you just want to die. Like seriously, you you just want to die. Would have? Have you ever felt your eyelashes hurt? Like no. <laughs> No, I have. <laughs> That's a, that was my withdrawal for sure. Like my, I remember my eyelashes hurt. I was like, I didn't even know this was possible. But it, it's, it's. I don't even know if you can compare it to the flu. It's just like you can't die, but you want to. <laughs> I don't know. Like the most uncomfortable <laughs> feeling you could think of, and just multiply it. At eating, you don't eat. If you do and you try, you just puke it back up. Mm -hmm. Shit your brains out for days on end. And do both at the same time in the beginning for a while. <laughs> both ends. And that's just withdrawal? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So now we're in 2000. We're still in 2011, right? You And and you need more. Yeah. Um, which you thought was just going to be a passing like, oh, just like a smarty every now and again. A f yeah, <laughs> a few here and there. Um, that actually ended up turning into I found somebody with Roxy's again. Right. And I started buying them. Because I had a decent job. I was getting good money. Um, then people started wanting like $30 a pill. And I'm like, I can't afford it. And this is what I was saying before about similar stories. How much was, how much was your, sp your prescription for 380 in Florida? To fill with my insurance? Yeah. Like $8. And they would You're sell. You're shitting me. Nah. Nope. And they would sell for 15 to 20 a piece at the time. So, so you can easily make. A G or, or more. Yeah, I was... No, wait, I did bad math on that. You can make like <laughs> you, 10 grand you off make, your prescription. You can make a lot of money. But the thing is, you you only sell a few and you end you up need the taking rest. <laughs> the rest for yourself. Yeah. Right. But like I said, I was making enough that when we did run out, I could just go and buy more to hold me over until that point. So something happened with the pill market 
in 2011, 2012, where... Yeah, the FBI started cutting down on these doctors, and they only let them prescribe a certain amount. Um, they couldn't go over X amount or whatever, and all these people that were just handing them out like candy ended up getting shut down. Yeah, but meanwhile, most of their patients are now yeah. addicts. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, what ends up happening, and me in particular, and I know a lot of people can relate, is that they end up getting so expensive that now I can't afford my habit, but I need it because I need to function, so now I gotta find an alternative, which is where a lot of people start going bad, we'll say. And they start with the next best thing. Which is intravenous drug use. Yeah, and actually in the beginning it wasn't even for me either. It was just snorting it, which is the same way that I took my pills. Crush them and snort them. I never. Oh, you ate never. Them. You never just. You never just never like. Just oh, here's a snapple. Them. I'm gonna eat some. <laughs> nope. Here's a snapple. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, don't know. that just caught me off guard. <laughs> don't talk about Miller Lite. I can talk about that. No, no, no. I, it's everything totally else. Fine. I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I just know. wasn't expecting that. <laughs> I just. I. I didn't understand why. So different people have different ways of doing it. People will tell you they just they'll put it in their mouth and you know suck on it like a candy until it's down to nothing. Me, I just would suck the coating off, crush them, and snort it because it hits you faster. And that was the point because you, you wanted to feel better quicker. Absolutely. And when you do it, it just kind of, you forget about everything that's going on. It kind of washes everything away. Do you, do you, remember, do you remember that time period or the moment where you're like, uh, I, I, need, I need to find something else? Yeah, when I couldn't afford it anymore. I mean, what, what, I mean, what was going through your head? Was there fear? Was there... I mean, to be like, this is, this is a big next step. So the, the first time that it ever happened, I was, um, with the guy that I was getting the, uh, the Roxy's from. And he's like, you're spending so much money on these. He's like, why don't you just try this? He's like, it's the same thing. It's just like taking two or three of the other ones, but instead of paying $90 for three, you know, you can get it for $10. And I'm like, there's no way. Like I, I seen people overdose, like, uh, one of my good friends growing up overdosed a few times on it. And I'm like, I, there's no way. And then one day I'm like, you know what? I'll just try a little bit. And, I mean, I was, it, it, and that's all it takes is a split second. Yeah. I was on my way to the fair. Uh, I was taking the Bloomsburg fair. <laughs> no, the Wayne County fair, oh, okay. <laughs> which is coming up again. Um, I know. I think I said Charlie Daniels play there. <laughs> <laughs> so I was taking no my relevance on the story whatsoever. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I was taking my son there and I'm like, all right, I'm just going to try a little bit and see what happens. So I took like a half of a bag at the time and I was like, wow, this ain't bad. And you snorted it. And I snorted it. And then like at the fair, I snorted the other half and I was like, all right, this could work. And, uh, yeah, it started from there. I ended up, um, like, so how, keep going. I don't I, want to interrupt you yet. No, that, um, I ended up finding a few other people that did it and they couldn't get it. And I'm like, well, you know, if I buy 20 or 30, I could give them 10 or 20 and then I get 10 for free for myself. Right. So I just started getting more and more and more. And then I found more people. They knew people. And um, in the beginning, all I did was was snort it. I had no ambition to take it IV or shoot it, whatever you want to say at that so how much, how, time I mean, So explain to me like what a bag is. It's... Uh, so a tenth, it, it's a, a powder, a tenth of a gram, point one. It's powder. Um, it's literally if you, it, the same as a little Coke baggie. It's a tiny line across the bottom. That's all it is. Tiny had, amount. So you're buying thirty bags, selling twenty, keeping ten for yourself. Just yeah, just saying at the time. Yeah. So what what year did what year did you start snorting? Two thousand twelve, maybe. Start snorting it? Yeah, somewhere around there, right around uh, when I. 12, 16, yeah. Yep. And when did you start becoming an entrepreneur? <laughs> <laughs> I always, For lack of a know, better word. In college I did because I did the same thing. Like even with weed, that's what I did at the time. Like I would get enough for myself and then sell the rest so that I didn't have to pay for it. And it just continued and happened with, with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> if I buy it for 100, sell it for two, make 100 profit, get free. Yeah. All so right. Yeah, math came in handy. Yeah. Um, but it ended up that the same thing, like with pills in the beginning, it was only a few here and there. And then I got used to it and it 
turned into four or five to you know five, five to bags. six yeah to six to eight to ten and um a lot of the people that i was dealing with kept saying the same thing um their motto was uh, why snort it and waste it when you can shoot it and taste it oh, that sounds like a terrible i've never motto. seen that if, in a t-shirt yet <laughs> <laughs> If you ever want to not live by a motto, make it that one. Anybody? <laughs> like, don't. That's just not. Up until now, my whole motto was don't eat yellow snow. But you know, just don't that, be an asshole. Yeah, it was don't be an asshole. But now it's don't. Now it's <laughs> don't snort it and waste it when you, you can, can shoot, shoot it and, and taste, taste it. it. Jesus. I mean, that's that. I mean, even by today's standards, that sounds nuts. <laughs> So the, the, this, um, I went to this kid's house one day and he's like, I'll do it for you. I'm like, all right, let's, let me see what the fuss is about. About shooting up. Yeah. So he ended up doing it for me. Were you nervous as hell or what? I was, I was, but I'm like, but how many bags were you up to snorting at that time? Best guess. Around 10. We'll just say 10. You were snorting 10 bags a day. 10, 15, give or take. Okay. And I'm like, if I could shoot one or two and have the same result then that's less money that I'm worrying about. So I only did one the first time that it happened, and uh, it didn't do anything. I'm like, what the fuck are these people talking about? This is pointless. Like, this does nothing. Right. So I'm like, here, do two more. So oh. he does two more. And I was like, whoa, okay. So that's what I'm missing. And it was like the... I mean, so what's... So, so it was like the warmest, fuzziest feeling from head to toe and it literally will start here and it'll just work its way down your body and you are the most relaxed laid back and not you, you don't have a care in the world that's you're just ah. like i mean how 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 important was that for you at the time to and i'm not and i'm, I'm not saying drug use i'm saying to not have a care in the world Oh, it was big because I worried about every little issue, problem. Did you suffer from anxiety as a kid? I probably still do, but, you know, I was never went to a doctor. I self-diagnosed. Oh, and self-medicated. <laughs> you know, and self-medicated. <laughs> I said, all right, yeah, I have this problem, so I'll fix it this way. Yeah, you went from telemarketer um, to MD real okay. quick. <laughs> all right. Again, not something I recommend either. <laughs> telemarketing. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, I mean, because because I, I I used to I did work with um, uh, a district attorney in one of the local counties, and they were talking, and he was he was talking about um, you know heroin addicts and and opioid addicts, and you know I said to him one day I said I said you know that I said the, the the thing about people who use heroin it's not when they're using it it's when they're not that's when crimes get committed that's when stupid decisions are made that's when it is know, the a, shit hits the fan and right. he and 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 he agreed with me but he looked at um opioid addicts kind of in a negative light like it's scum of the earth like that um and god rest his soul him and i had a conversation um a couple of months before he passed away where where he called me up and he said he said uh he says i get it now and I said, I said, I don't, I said, well, what the fuck are you talking about? And he's like, remember that conversation we had about, you know, opioid addicts and heroin addicts? And I said, yeah. And he goes, well, actually, we, we arrested a guy and I sat down with him and we probably talked for four or five hours. And he goes, by the end of it, I understood it. And I said, well, what did he say? And he goes, it's, it, he goes, it's something I can never understand, which is imagine love times a hundred. He goes and I and I and, and as a law enforcement officer, I don't know how to fight that. I don't know how to I don't know how to convince people that love times a hundred is a bad thing. Because in their minds it, it, it absolutely makes sense. So he got like incredible perspective where he didn't look at it as, you know, everyone's just a number who 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 takes drugs to being like, Oh, these are individual people who have serious problems that that we need to together help um is that what it felt like that it was love times a hundred it is and it's something that you need every single day that consumes your world and your day 24 hours that's all you think about that's all you want that's all you need and that's 
as bad as it is to say that's at the time that's all you pretty much care about is getting it finding it doing it i was there and i took care of them i can't say that i didn't but i wasn't i wasn't there i was there physically i wasn't there mentally as much as i should have been at that time i mean if at, at that time i mean after you started to to use it in a way that stereotypically we know how it's used um if you had to choose you know son family or or heroin what would you have chosen well i i pretty much made that choice at that time and i continued down that path so for me and i know for a lot of other people they're going to choose that any day of the week well, I, over I, anything I, else and, and and i i think i I think I kind of knew that you were going to say that, and I'm just I'm just trying to understand like how you rationalize it. The best way that I've ever heard anybody say it was when I ended up in rehab, which I'll get to shortly. Um, we had a guy come in and speak, and he said when he was in the throes of addiction, doing the same exact thing, he said if he had a newborn baby and you put a bag behind the crib that his son was in, he would go around the crib to get to the bag and get it before he did anything for his son. And how, how do you, how do you, how do you explain that? Like that's because, because, because I think, I think because of this pandemic that we're going through, you know, and, and we'll get to the, maybe the possible reasons why we're at where we're at later. But I think, I, I don't think people understand the, like the, the 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 mentality of what that means like it changes you it changes you in a way where this one thing becomes the only thing that's what i'm saying it consumes every part of your life it takes over and that's the only thing that you care about i don't i don't know how to explain it unless you've been through it and to anybody else looking from the outside in that hasn't been through it You know, they could say, oh, well, you know, I would take my son. But when you have to have it to function and that's all you care about, you literally, that's all you, that's everything. That's that's your whole world right there. And you're not being like hyperbolic or, or, you know, exaggerative. I don't know if that's a word, but you're not exaggerating at all where you're saying that became the number one thing. It was the number one thing in my life without a doubt. To the point where if I didn't have it in the morning, um, you know, and I started withdrawing, I would lay in the bed and not do anything. And as soon as that phone call came in that it was around, I was up in the car and on my way. Like, get your shoes on. Let's go. Like throwing, Mm -hmm. throwing kids in the car and going. That was it. I did the same thing. I didn't have children at the time, but when I was in that same aspect of my life, I did the same thing. It's terrible, <laughs> but it is. It's all. It consumes everything. I'm. I, I'm. I'm. I, I. I just don't know how. I. I don't. And that was the thing about my friend. Like I didn't. Neither one of us knew how to convey that to people who have never done it. Like we. We. Like we. Because. Because. Uh, because to. I think to combat the problem, you have to understand the problem. And I think a lot of people don't understand the problem. And I think they just think that like, you know. Like I make the joke about when you know when people go you know I'm heavy I'm like well put the fork down yeah, I know. you know what I mean like that's you know what I mean like it, like that's a quick like checkers move on, on on how to like you know Monday morning quarterback somebody's life but in actuality like does it give them comfort do they feel better you know is it is you it can't yeah so so I, I a lot I, of people say oh well why don't you just stop. I can't. That, that would have been a wonderful I, I, right. option. Like, I would have loved that option. I, I want to. I, <laughs> that easy. I mean, I mean, I mean, is that just as ridiculous as a comment? A, a comment as saying, you know, I want to go to that mountain over there, and somebody goes, well, "Why don't you just fly over?" Yeah, <laughs> that's how ridiculous okay. that is. To like, well, why don't you just stop? Yeah, that's like the worst. That those people have no idea, like you were saying, of what is going on at all. Like what's going through these people's heads. That's. Oh, well, you know, they're the scum of the earth. They're this, they're that. But it's it's a problem. That's all that's in your head. That's all you think about and all you can care about. Period. I mean, did all your friends end up being 
so that's a, a whole nother story in itself is all my real friends. All right, well, let's, I let's stopped, move. Stopped, <laughs> yes. Yeah, segue. Yeah. I stopped talking to entirely. And my so-called friends at that point were all the people that I were dealing with. They did it too. So they were in the same lifestyle as I was. And that's who I started hanging around with. So now you're all just doing those things. I get it. At that point now, I'm. it's being delivered to my house. I don't go anywhere. I don't do anything. I sit on my couch. I get rid of it all day long and just do it all day. So this is, so you started um, in what, 2012, 13? Yeah, this is probably a good three years now into it. Yeah, but you started 16. in 2012, 13, right? Started doing it, yeah, probably yeah, around So now. how many years, I mean... I'd, I'd, I'd call it the upside down. If up you ever watch Stranger Things, like you're living in like this black hole. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, how many years were you living in the September black hole? September 1st, 2016. It's oddly specific that you remember that date. I do. September, so for three years, basically. There's a reason I remember that date. All right. So so in that three years, I mean, what was what's family life like? What's fatherhood like? What's Didn't your, talk your personal to my life like? Um, my family were trying to do what they could for me, trying to help me. And they knew what was going on, right? They did. And I, in my head, you know, I'm so smooth and, you know, no one has any idea. I'm, you know, Harry Potter out here. (laughs) (laughs) I was a... That's amazing. (laughs) I was a mess. We're all um, muggles. I know what's going on. <laughs> but yeah, so the way they I mean, tried- I mean, that's that, I mean, that's part of addiction. It's like you you think that you're like a con you're like a con man. You're, like you're, you're yeah. a con. You absolutely are. Yeah, and you con everybody out of everything. Feelings aren't real. The no. Promises aren't real. Emotions non-existent. Don't make a difference. Wow. Yeah. And that and that was three years. And people and your parents were trying to help you. They were trying to help me by getting my kids taken away and making me realize that. You know, I needed help that some, I had a problem, that I had an issue. I mean, so they were fighting you for your kids and you're like, no, I can take care of them. I was fighting with them about it. Like, I'm, you know, I don't want nothing. I can't believe you guys would do that to me. How could you do How this? How dare but, you? Yeah, like, you know, and really looking back on it now, it was probably, if it did happen, it would have been the best thing at that time. Um, it didn't happen. Um, children and youth came quite a few times and they could never do anything um did you know they were coming no i had no idea when they came i just never answered the door anyway even if i was there i just jesus christ that's the way to avoid children and youth (laughs) when they ring the doorbell you just go (laughs) everyone quiet pretty much yeah and then i mean are you kidding me no the place i was where were you living at this time in scranton actually right by the hospital up here um right on madison avenue um so they'd knock and then I had a back door with stairs, so we would just go out the back door and just leave. And then we'd come back, and there'd be a sign on the door, you know, we were here, call us. Like, yeah, okay. What, like like, like your FedEx, you weren't home, so we didn't deliver your FedEx package? <laughs> yeah. Like, like call us. I mean, I'm, I'm not, try, I'm not trying to. Call us at your time. You know, we need you to come down and take I'm, a drug I'm, test. I'm not like, trying to condemn children and youth, but, at, but that, that seems a little bit loony to me. <laughs> no, I, have, I have no words either. I don't know. <laughs> I, I mean, you they, know, even when they did come, there was food in the house. It wasn't filthy. Um, there was really nothing they could. Were you do. hiding drugs? Oh yeah, I had drugs in my house at all times. Like where where were your hiding places in case somebody ever showed up? <laughs> uh, right next to my bed. They weren't hiding. They were there, just not hiding. And no one ever noticed it. No, I nobody ever went upstairs in my house, ever. They oh. don't come to your house and look through your house. They come and make sure that there's food, that the kids aren't getting the crap beat well, out I mean, of them. Well, if they're not looking through the house, what, do they just take your word for it? They don't. They can't look through your house. I, oh, because it's not I like know. a warrant. Yeah. Right, I, I don't think they can. Oh. The only thing they could say is, you know, we need you to come down and take a, a drug test or whatever. And... At that time, all I did was, you know, stop for a day or two, chug water, go take the piss test, and then yeah, because it's out of your system in like what two days? Two, three days, yeah. Pots, what thirty? A lot, yeah, a good month. It clings to your fat cells. (laughs) (laughs) It's like saying that. Put the fork down. Uh, All right, so so 
I mean, was that? I mean, was that three years of hell, or was it? Yeah, brutal hell. Absolutely, it was probably the worst three years in my life. Because, like I said, that was all that consumed me every day. That's all I worried about. I just sat on my couch. People would come and go. I actually, in the beginning, I would go everywhere to get rid of what I needed to, and nobody ever came to my house. Right. Um, towards the end, I started just being lazy. Right. And at this point, I had moved to um, the top of Green Ridge Street, Ferdinand, and I was staying there in a house, and um, I just had everybody Where come there. Where money? Drugs? From selling. Oh, yeah. okay. Yep. Um, so that was paying rent, that was paying the bills, that was buying the groceries? Yeah, but at this point, I was getting like five, six bricks delivered a day, which a brick is 50 bags. So that was being delivered to my house every day. So I didn't have to go anywhere. I didn't have so to do anything. So 250 bags a day. 300. And then, again, I was doing the same thing. I would get rid of four, keep one for myself. Get rid of five, keep one for myself. And that was basically and what did what did you think like is there any thought of the future is there any thought of tomorrow that was my job at the time no i mean but like it, like do you ever did you ever go like what's this going to be like a week from now what's this going to be like a month from now like if i keep i because my question my question is basically like were you ever is there ever like a self-awareness where you're like this is this is not i don't foresee this ending well so the last few months before something happened, that's all I wanted to do was I wanted to stop. And I do you remember that moment where you're like, enough's enough. Yeah. Um, I was actually in New York. Uh, we were going to stop and we were going to move to New York. And I ended up like having one of those. I'm going out with a bang type yeah. moments. So we drove to New York. I had a bunch of stuff on me. Like expecting to never return to, from New York and no, go see to, Jesus. We were going. I was actually going to go to an interview the following day. And if I got the job, we were going to New York. So I'm like, I'm doing this with a bang. Right. So I had that. I had Coke. I was drinking, smoking. Like um, Before the interview? This is the night before the interview. Oh, so that took a that's going to go well. Took Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. A uh, bunch of Xanax. Um, Adderall, like I was going out with a bang. So I guess at some point at like four in the morning, I decided that it was a good idea to drive in New York in a town that I've never been to and was never in, had no idea where anything was. I ended up on the side of a road. Um, the cops came. And this is 2015, 2016? This was 2016. Um, it was snowing outside, so it was early 2016, January, okay. February. Um, all I remember that happened was the cop asked me for my ID. I told him I didn't have one as I was handing it to him. <laughs> and the next thing I knew, I'm sorry, that's kind of funny. I, I, it is. I know. I, and oddly enough, that's the only thing I remember about it. Um, I woke up in a hospital bed like two days later. Um, weirdly I was parked outside of the hospital is where they found me. Oh, Okay. So they literally had to transport me from one side of the road to the other. To the other. <laughs> so <laughs> it wasn't a long ambulance ride. Um, they said I had a seizure in the hospital. Um, that was how it happened. Um, if I were to guess now, looking back, I probably overdosed. Um, all the shit that I ended up taking that night, that would be my best guess. They said it was a seizure, but I, you know, again, I'm a medical doctor, obviously. So. Yeah. <laughs> I'm I have, happy. I'm happy you progressed without going to school for that. <laughs> yeah, that's what I think happened. Kids, this but, can um, be you. You could be a doctor if you just want to be. <laughs> you know what? After you, you would think that after something like that, you would be like, "God damn! Like I got a problem. Maybe I should quit." I mean, did they ask you anything about drug use? Oh yeah, the ladies like, um, we did a, a piss test on you. Do you know what you're positive for? And I'm like, everything. I'm positive, I'm positive for everything. <laughs> I'm like, I don't think anything. I don't, I, don't, I don't have anything in my system. And she's like, sweetheart, you lit up the whole panel. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh. I'm like, I didn't know it was real. She's like, yeah, yeah all right, bud. Like, <laughs> you lit up the, the panel. You yeah. Like a Christmas yeah, You made tree. a piece of paper glow. <laughs> But I, I, I knew it too. Like I literally was taking anything and everything that I could get my hands on at that point. 
But um, yeah. So you, you missed the interview. <laughs> missed the interview. Yeah. Um, made it back <laughs> to Pennsylvania in one piece. And um, just because they can't, because they can't arrest you for anything like that. No, right? I didn't actually have anything on me when they found me. So there was. So what are they going to do? I wasn't driving because I was pulled over on the side of the road too. Right. So they couldn't do anything anyway. Okay. As far as I understand, I right. wasn't out of state anyway. I'm from Pennsylvania in New York. Right. It's like um, I date raped myself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I took all those for years. Um, I don't remember anything. <laughs> for anyone that's listening I've never done that that's I was just a terrible joke let's move on <laughs> Xanax will do that too you don't remember anything that happens on Xanax yeah, I don't know why that Xanax that, is that such was... a bad drug they should just stop giving people that altogether. Mm-hmm. Like, alright so you'd think that, that that situation would be enough of a wake up call for you you would think but it wasn't I went right back to doing what I was doing um, moved back here and I ended up in on Ferdinand Street um, and like I said, I sat there all day. It was getting delivered. I didn't have to go anywhere. I got lazy. And going back to that date, September 1st, 2016, um, I was laying in bed with my daughter. My son was at a friend's house. And how old you, how old your daughter at the time? She 16. She was, uh, three. Okay. And your son um, was eight. Okay. Um, when I was, it was like 12, 12, 15. In the afternoon. In the afternoon. Um, I was up all night, so we were sleeping. I mean, the kid, are the kids in the house while all this is going on? Yeah, they were there all day, for, every yeah, day. Yeah, but I mean, for that <clears throat> period of time, like 2016. They were there, both oh. of them. I just had my daughter then, and my son was, you know, old enough to know kind of what was going on, but not really. Okay. Um, but yeah, September 1st. About twelve fifteen, um, I heard a bang, and I heard you know um, Scranton Special Investigations Division. This is a drug raid, and the first thing that crossed my mind, because you're so Laying out of it and unaware of anything that's going on around you, when they kicked my door in and said that, the first thing that went through my head was, "This is probably for the neighbor. This isn't me. They got the wrong house." <laughs> Okay. I'm just saying, like, you are literally unaware of anything going on around you. All and right. I, people are going to laugh, and it's funny, because it's funny to me now, but that's what was going through my head when it happened. Like, yeah, okay, bud, they, they do an investigation on you, and they're kicking in the wrong door. Like, no. <laughs> so they, um, they come up the stairs. They had their, you know, weapons drawn, laser lights were out, and I'm like, holy shit, like, shit's going down. It's just you and your daughter in the house? Just me and my daughter in the house at that point. Okay. Um, what had happened was a kid that was coming to my house every day for probably two years. Um, I don't know if they caught him on the way out one day or he got in trouble. Uh, they had him do controlled buys. Um, he became a, a informant, whatever you want to call him. Mm-hmm. Um, he, and I ended up selling to him twice. And the third day was when they kicked my door in. And they arrested me. Um, I got brought down to... I mean, right in front of your daughter. Right in front of my daughter. Children and youth were there with them. They came in, took my daughter. Um, they had to go find my son. And I got taken to Lackawanna County right here. What was your daughter doing when this was all happening? Uh, she was freaking out a little bit. Um, I, really, I mean, how shocking is that to a, a young kid that age? I'm sure... I'm sure it had an effect on her to what degree now, I don't know. But when I got locked up the first time that they came to visit me, I was only in there for 60 days. But the first time that they showed up that I was functioning, um, she said, Daddy, are they making you wear those silver bracelets again? Again. Yeah, she was talking about when they the handcuffed time, yeah. me, the silver bracelets. Right. She didn't know what they were, so she called them silver bracelets. Right. So I know she remembers when it happened. If she still does now, I don't know. But um, So what were they that, looking that for when they hurt. kicked it down? Oh, they, they thought I had, uh, you know, barrels of shit in my house at the time, which, thank God, I didn't. I was actually down to my last couple. and Bricks? No, my last couple bags, thank okay. God. Um so they were only able to get eight that I had on me. Um, 
in the newspaper or whatever it said 30 some that they found in the house but where they got that number i don't know but it doesn't even matter it doesn't make a difference um it could have been eight or eight thousand it doesn't matter no it, yeah i mean charge wise yeah it would have mattered but well i don't know the law ultimately <laughs> no, it doesn't make a difference um when i got to jail it was actually like a rock was being lifted off my shoulders i knew at that point that it was over I mean, were you still, were you, were you still like, even at, when they kicked the door in, were you stoned? I had stuff in my system. I just went to sleep. So it was still in me. Right. So I wasn't withdrawing yet. Right. So even that first day when I got to County, um, I was okay. Yeah. The second day when I woke up was a living hell. It was the worst thing that has ever happened to me in my life. Hands down. Now, where are you? I'm in County locked up. So they, you're in a jail cell. I'm in a jail cell. Um, they didn't put anybody with me because I was sick. Um, I was literally... I said eight I by four? I don't know what they are. They're small. They're tiny. Yeah. I didn't eat for 14 days. Um, if you're detoxing, they say um, they'll keep you in classification for 10 days until you feel better, and then they move you to general population. I ended up staying in class for 14 days because I, I didn't eat. I was throwing up, puking, shitting, everything, laying on the floor like I couldn't sleep. It was horrible. I and mean, what, what goes through your mind? Like, what's 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 the, I mean, you want to die at that to, point. You want to die. You want to die. And you, you won't. You won't die from withdrawing at all. But it is the worst feeling in the world, like I was explaining before. And then to have to do that in a jail cell when you know you have no other option but to just sit there and wait it out makes it even worse. So, so minutes minutes feel like hours, hours feels like days. Those 14 days felt like eight months to me. They were bad. Even is, it, is there is there medical attention? Is anybody paying is anybody paying attention to you? <laughs> they, or? they did. They came and checked on me and made sure I was all right. Um, the only thing that they gave me was Pepto Bismol and something like Tylenol, basically, and that was it. And I'm like, they, they ain't gonna I mean, do would you, I mean, would you do anything? I mean, mm-hmm. would you have ended it in there if you could have? No, I don't think I was at that point. Um, Even though it was terrible. Yeah, I you want you want to die and you feel like you're gonna die, but you know there's some type of light at the end of the tunnel if you know one more day one more day one more day right i waited it out i ended up going to um the dorms they call them it's like uh 90 guys in one space there's six like bays 15 right. people to a bay right and even when i got there i was still bad like i couldn't walk i couldn't drink um i was eating a little bit but every day seemed to get a little bit better. And as I started talking to people in there, I heard that there was something in Lackawanna County um, that's Lackawanna County Treatment Court. And it's, you know, people that have nonviolent drug offenses that they feel that they can rehabilitate, basically Uh help, send them in rehab, you know, treat them and have them functioning members of society again and not just throw them in jail and I mean in all those years I mean you were not like you know jacking cars or I never did because um, the guy that I met always had it and he delivered it and it was always there so it never came to that point Um, I did pawn a lot of stuff uh, quite a few times like you know the thing was people brought me a lot of stuff to trade yeah. Like, I don't have money, but I have a PlayStation 4. Can you do something? Or I have an iPad. Can you do something for me? Really? And, absolutely. You sh- I had a house full of electronics. And um, I like RC stuff, like remote control. I, yeah, had, yeah. I had like four helicopters. I had remote control cars, boats that people just brought. And they're like, I don't have money, but, you know, give me five for, you know, a $300 RC car and we'll call it even. So wow. I had a lot of stuff that I ended up pawning to get money um, t- as well to help support myself. But um, So now what point, what point in jail do they actually like <clears throat> charge you? I was charged that the first day that I went. That, what, were, what were the charges? Um, I had two, two uh, sales, which ended up being felonies. Right. Um, they gave me a... 
basically using a cell phone to uh, criminal use of a communication device, which is using a cell phone to make right. transactions. And then they also gave me another um, was um, endangering the welfare of a child because my daughter was in the house at that point. Any of those do you dispute? Actually, at this point now, they're getting dismissed. No, no, no. I mean, but at the time, were you? Did you dispute any of them? Oh, no, be like, no, that's no, not. No, there was no. I wasn't. Fighting. So you kind of, you kind of did like the. Yeah, you got me. I did, and and I don't, and I don't disagree with anything that you're accusing me of. Right, and part of that reason was when I was in there, I heard about treatment court, and if you successfully complete treatment court, they they charge you in the beginning, but it's pending charges right. based upon your outcome of treatment court. If you uh-huh. successfully complete it. They'll dismiss your charges. If you stay with it three years later, they have them expunged off your record. So I'm like, you know what? I did it. I'm here and I can get help. And these guys are willing to do it for me. I wanted to stop a while ago. I physically could not. Now I have that option. And I'm like, you know what? Maybe it's the best thing for me anyway. So I pled into treatment court. Um, 60 days later, they let me out. It was the day after Halloween. And they sent me to Cove Forge in basically outside of Pittsburgh. Um, I was there for 18 days. I actually felt decent when I got there. So I wasn't on any type of like Suboxone taper right. or anything like that. Um, I felt good when I got there. <clears throat> Still wasn't able to think. Clearly? Clearly, no. But... Um, I mean, is your brain like a fog or... Then, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, it was and emotion wise like y- you're able to feel again so like you know you're looking at the woods and you want to just like cry like it's the most beautiful thing you've ever seen in your life even though is, you know, it, but is there anger there too there was there there was humiliation more than anything um it's it's embarrassing or whatever you know people say it's embarrassing they don't want people to know but like we were saying, it's all that you think about and all that you care about at the time. So getting arrested at that point was probably the best thing that could have happened. If it didn't, there's like, a, I would say a 99% chance I probably wouldn't be here right now. I mean, were you, before September 1st, were you, were you was part of you like, dear, dear God, I hope, I hope somebody intervenes just, and just, does just, something yeah where it's not like it's not like an intervention it's more like you're fucking going to jail absolutely because the, 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 the few months before that happened before my house got raided that's exactly what I wanted I mean, so you're almost like wishing for that to happen yeah part of me is and part of me isn't because you don't want to go through the, it, I, mean, I don't want to go through the bullshit but I don't but boy do I want to get clean yeah yeah and you do and a lot of people are in that same boat they just don't know how to do it and I didn't know how to do it either I don't recommend getting yourself arrested to have it happen but (laughs) it was honestly the best thing that could have happened at that point I mean do you think in your life that might be the best thing that's ever happened to you is getting arrested besides your kids being born right it it definitely saved my life if it's not one of the top things that could have it saved my life for sure. So then what was, so how was treatment court? What was like, what was, well, what did you have to do? Were you, were you kind of like, so my thoughts, there's is, a lot of people who get apprehensive about stuff like that where they're like, Oh, I have to go fucking do that. Like, I don't want to fucking do that. Like, it is and I find lot. that, and I find that people who want to get sober, but just point me where I, and tell me what I got to do. Mm-hmm. You it's, know? it's intense. And you need to do in the beginning, there's four phases phase, obviously one, two, three, four phase one is 30 days. You need to see probation once a week. They put you on. Now you're the, out of jail now. You're out of jail. Once yeah. once you plead into um, treatment, court. treatment court, they send you to rehab. When you're done with rehab, you come back. You have to stay in the county. You can't leave the county without permission. Um, so you're being supervised. You are on the color system every morning at 530. You call in. You call in. And if your color is blue, and like they'll say blue, red, white. If your color is one of those, you go in and take a test by 8 o'clock or 8.30 in the morning that day. Now, after you left that that place outside of Pittsburgh, were you scared shitless to come back here? I didn't know what I was going to do when I came back. Um, children and youth had my kids at that point. Um, they only had them for, didn't have them? They only had them for one day, and they took them to my parents' house. My parents agreed to take them in and until I came back, and you know everything got figured out. 
So they had both of them. So they were foster parents for the two of them. I mean, but there's got to be some sort of fear about coming back because they always say people, places, and things. Now you're going back to the same place that you were, you know, after you're leaving Pittsburgh. There was, but I knew coming back that I was on, I was being supervised, that I was on colors, that I had to see my probation officer once a week. I had to go to four meetings a week more in the beginning um you have to do a 90 and 90 right which is 90 meetings 90, 90 days, days yeah. and you have to get a paper signed if you don't and you Doesn't miss a count. day you start over if you're on day 88 and you don't get your sheet signed you, you gotta go back to 90 90 start you start your 90 90 so over. what are the consequences <laughs> like let's see if you if you uh peed hot you go back to county and you sit until they decide whether or not you deserve another chance and that you should be given one or if they um, should terminate you from the program and then you serve out the rest of your sentence, whatever it what, might be. What, what were you looking at? I don't know what the actual sentence would have been. It was a maximum of 25 years. <gasps> that's a maximum though. That's what it could have been. You would never do that amount, but that's what it possibly could have been. It was like 10 years for each of the felony counts of a sale and then five years, I think, for the endangering. You would never even do anything close to that, but that's what they said. No, but still, the maximum is a quarter century. Well, that scared the shit out of me enough. Even if I only did one year, that's one year in state prison that I don't want to do. Right. That's 365 days that I never want to see a place of ever. All right. So you get back here, you're doing the program. Any issues? No, I actually, the biggest thing going through it, the first thing they tell you, is don't fight it just take suggestion if we ask you to get a sponsor go get a sponsor if we're telling you go to meetings or asking you go there's a reason they do it and a reason they keep you on it is so that you have structure and you don't have free time to go do any of the other stuff and slowly it starts to become a routine everything instead of you know going to court every week now when you're in phase two and three, now it's only every other week. And as you start progressing, everything goes to once a month. And then eventually, before you know it, you end up graduating. When you so graduate, how long how long is treatment court's program? It depends on when your dates fall. Uh-huh. Um, they only have two graduations a, a year. year. One yeah. is in May, one is in November. So if Wait, you, did we just lose your microphone? I think so. I don't hear it anymore. And there we go. <laughs> All good. It's the drug gods trying to ruin us. <laughs> it's Beelzebub. <laughs> so if you if you end up that you're done with phase four in December and you just missed November's graduation, yeah. you have to sit and wait till May's graduation. I mean, but you still have to to do what you're supposed to do. You do. At that point, you have to go to court once a month. You see your probation officer once a month, and you see your case manager once a month. So you're still doing a decent amount and you still, I had to go to a place called PATH Mm -hmm. um, and get counseling, drug and alcohol counseling. Same thing as DATS, T-PELS. Yep. I just chose to go to PATH instead. Right. So I had a counselor there. I had to continue seeing them up until graduation. I mean, that that involves mental health and stuff too, right? (laughs) Yeah. They go over your whole mental health history. And did they, did you learn anything there that you'd like to share that? You know, uh, I I mean, even about you. as as an as an internal personality thing or i i didn't and the reason is halfway into it the the counselor that i had just up and left one day like what? i literally went for my appointment on a friday morning and i got there and they're like oh she quit oh. <laughs> yesterday she just got up and left and i'm like well okay was yeah was it well, what, what about me and i'm yeah well that's what i said i'm like i i have two or three months left the treatment court like I don't I'm not going to sit down with a brand new counselor and start from square one and I'm not going to be here after three months anyway it's not right so I kind of just left it at that at that point um I went and seen the girl that replaced her a couple times she's like we'll just bring you in once a month we'll see how you're doing make sure everything's okay I mean how how important were, were some of those people that you had to report to 
and you maintaining your sobriety and you working towards, you know, getting your kids back and, you know. So there's two people to me that stand out immediately that are part of treatment courts team. Um, one is Tom Carter, who is my case manager. Um, I don't have to see him anymore, but I had meetings with him every week. And then I had, he runs the men's meetings at the ice box, which I think they changed the name. Someone else took it over, but, um, he was huge. He was big. He talked me through a lot. He probably helped me more than the lady from path did. Um, he's been down the road before he's like 40 years sober or whatever. So he understands. So it's not like I went in there and he was like, well, you know, we got another scumbag coming in, blah, blah, blah. No, no judgment whatsoever. He helped a lot. The other person without a doubt, um, is Marissa from children and youth. She did everything in her power to help me get an apartment, to help me get moved in anything that I needed so that I could get the kids back. So it wasn't, it wasn't like you were just, you know, left to your own devices and be like, figure it out, asshole. If you, even if you have an, like an apartment and you want to get moved in and you have to see the judge once a week and then Mm -hmm. every other week, you go and tell the judge, like, I'm trying to, uh, you know, better myself. I need, I need help though here. They do it. They help you. They give you whatever help you need. you surprised by that? Yeah. I actually, I was. This is Lackawanna County, right? Yep. And actually, children and youth, um, Marissa, helped me more than anybody. Um, She helped me get moved in. She actually came and picked me up and brought me to look at the apartment that I ended up moving into. So, like, they will go bend over backwards and go head over heels. Anything that you need. You need furniture, they'll get it for you. Do you, do you, was that a surprise to you? Because it seems like the way your life was, there wasn't a lot of people who would bend over backwards for you. There wasn't. There wasn't a lot of support at that time at all. Um, but I also didn't have, I had friends that I thought were friends. They're not. (laughs) No. And we talked about that before. Yeah. Um, you know, when I was locked up, how many of those people came to see me? None. Zero. How many of them called, wrote, put money on my books? None. Granted, I was in there 60 days, but all those people, I don't talk to any of them anymore. Not one. And even when you're in treatment court, they'll tell you every day, look, don't people, places, and things, change them. You go back to those people, you're going to go back to doing exactly what you were doing before. You go back to the same places, talk to the people, you do the same things, you're, you're, you're fucked. You're screwed. So what's, so what's left now for you? As far as treatment court's yeah, concerned? Yeah. Um, no, uh, November, I just graduated. After you graduate, um, they give November you- November of 2017 you graduated? Just now. Just in uh, November that passed. Or, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. So, cancel that. May. I just graduated in May. <laughs> sorry. So wait, you, so you graduated treatment court two months ago. Yes. Congratulations, man. Mm-hmm. Thank you. How do you how do you feel? It's like do you walk across the state cap and gown? You do. They have <laughs> not a cap and gown. I did get fully dressed up though. I was suit and tie and everything. I mean, that's got to be you got to be proud of yourself for that. I mean, that's got to be a prideful moment, don't so you think? So this is at the college right here at Lackawanna. Lackawanna. They have yeah. it, and yeah. you do walk across the stage. The judge says something about each person. Yeah. Um, but the best part for me was they show your picture, your before and after. They show oh, when really? they show your mug shot from when you got arrested. And they show your shot from like a week before graduation. What a difference in people's faces, their demeanor. They, when people come in and you look at them, like they're gray, they're ghostly. They have no life in them whatsoever. Then you see them at graduation and I was looking around and people are glowing. Like everybody's eyes are sparkling. And I actually thought to myself, like as a judge or as part of that team that's involved, right. that's got to be one of the most satisfying feelings that you could ever have is just looking around the room and being like, I changed somebody. Like I helped turn this person's life around, like look at them from day one and look at them where they're at now. I mean, did you ever mm-hmm. think that you could accomplish on, on, on August 31st, 2016, <laughs> did you ever think... No, no, and absolutely not. I never thought it would turn around. Um, but like I said before, it's the best thing that could have ever happened. It's been not many people say me getting arrested is the best thing that could have ever happened. I know it's it's so weird, but like 
I don't even know if I would be here otherwise. Just to put it into perspective, right before I got arrested, I was doing like 50 bags a day, 40 to 50 a day. That's a lot. It's a lot. And now I thought I was able to function. Looking back on it, people were probably like, oh, <laughs> but um, I was I mean, is it, I mean, is it like the is it like the cliched thing where like, you know, the train spotting thing where it feels like, you know, you shoot up and you you slide into the bed and See, I mean, everybody does. But I wasn't like that. Like I would do it and I would go romp around the town. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was never like romp. stuck. I was, <laughs> would you romp around yeah. town in a romper? Do we need to look We're at that sc- definition too? Yeah, look it up. We're in screen. Hey, so you, you can't walk here. You got to romp around. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so what's, what's life like? I mean, this is, this is, so you're coming up on, so it'll be two years this September that this happened. It is. And I had two major things happen during that. If I wasn't sober and they happen, I probably would have had a worse reaction. Like Um, like traumatic things? Definitely. Um, My son's mother in July of 2016 passed away. So he lost his mother. Wait, that was right before you got... That was right before I got arrested. I mean, mean, was it from... use she yeah she had a lot of problems um she found out she was hiv positive and uh she ended up overdosing and i mean was she using was she intravenously using she, she was in and out of jail she had a lot of issues i don't know was, what she, she, was, was she like that before you met her she was doing pills with me when i was doing but it that's what i'm saying like she it wasn't after bad I, after i left i don't know what she did what happened what she got into i had no communication with her at all So I don't know what ended up happening that it got to that point, but obviously not good as well. I mean, I mean, I mean, but yeah, but also at that time, I mean, how capable are you to console your son in that, in that moment? Because I I wasn't, but he really has no recollection of who she was as a person. Anyway, Um, we were gone and moved away from her right as he was turning one, basically. Right. So he doesn't, she was never there for him from day one anyway. And you it said she never like checked in or. No, no communication at all. So it was almost like she was a ghost. Pretty much. Sad. Yep. And then um, March 21st of 17, um, I ended up losing my brother, which was. Wait, you're so you're six months sober. Just fresh into being sober and my brother passed away. Now, how did it, now what, what happened there? So he ended up. You don't up, have to talk about it. No, please don't. No, no, no. Okay. It's, it's, it's all right. He, um, he lived in Florida also. He, he had his own demons and his own problems. Um, he ended up going to the hospital. He was complaining that he had pain in his back. They sent him home. They said that he was just there trying to get pain medication. Mm-hmm. Um, he went back the next day and he didn't have insurance. They told him they weren't going to do any testing, you know, that he was just there trying to get pain pills again they sent him home the third day uh he was cleaning the floor with his girlfriend and he ended up passing out on the floor um they called the ambulance the ambulance came to get him and he ended up dying um a little bit after that he had an aneurysm on his heart that burst and it was probably something that if they just tested and did what they should have it probably could have been prevented but was it was I mean was he in addiction too at the time yeah I don't know how bad he was when that happened but he was in and out of jail a couple times for drugs or yeah as well so I mean mean, but but that goes back to the thing that I was I you know that I was saying before where people think that you know they're fucking junkies fuck them Mm-hmm. You mm-hmm. know, so then he goes, you know, regard, regardless of whether or not somebody does, does drugs, I mean, isn't it the responsibility of the hospital to at least, you, would you can claim all you want that you're, you're, you're pill shopping and you're, you're trying to get pills, but like, what if? Yeah. Yep. And, and this is, this is the example of what if. Right. And it happened and it happened to be my brother of all people too. So, I mean, I, I, when I got, when I got sober, it, it was, there was a couple tragedies and I was like, if I can get 
and it was that was like at the moment it happened almost my first thought was like can i get through this you know and if i can get through this i think i'm gonna be okay had you know? had i not been sober at the time i would have been doing everything that i possibly could have got my hands on to cope right um luckily enough i was sober and when it happened i was actually able to be there and be responsible for what was going on well and be lucid and right and yeah absolutely so without being sober and i wouldn't have made it through it so that was a big um that was a big test absolutely and even treatment court like even the judge was like please just stay the course stay focused on what yeah. you're doing don't deviate you know you're doing good up to this point i mean when something like that happens i mean do you call a sponsor or like what i had do you do? A, i did i had a sponsor um i s still actually talked to him um he came to the funeral as well so he was there to support me how important is that to have somebody there to be there for those moments you know what it feels good to actually have people behind you and supporting you and being positive right and not just being looked down on you know, for what you're doing. Do you feel like for most of your life that you were you, you were kind of like a man on an island, or do you or do you feel like you you pushed people away, or uh, maybe a little bit of both? I never thought for any one minute that I was normal. <laughs> None of us met, are. I never, still still don't, holy the shit. Same room. <laughs> I still don't think I'm normal, but um. <laughs> I'm yeah. wearing zip-up cowboy boots. <laughs> you get a hole in your <laughs> Yeah, I'm wearing my Sunday socks. Is there really a hole in there? Right there. <laughs> oh, the dog bit it. See, but it didn't bite the toe, so I can wear it. Because there's nothing worse than putting your shoes on and feeling your one toe going so you out. you don't want to be normal, Josh. Yeah, for people, who, to you. for people who can't see, there's my Sunday socks. <laughs> <laughs> to go up my novena posts. <laughs> Did you, have you been noticing this the whole time? Yes. You even said a word? No, I didn't. I've seen it a few it's times. Like, so, yeah, but he's I'm trying to be so serious. What am I supposed to do? Oh, by the way, hey, hold on. Time yeah, out. Tell me about you serious. Want, you want yeah. to talk about time scumbags out, out. for a second? <laughs> <laughs> the real ones. <laughs> there it goes. <laughs> yes. If it makes you feel any better, I didn't know. <laughs> I'm like Dr. Phil wearing clown outfits. Like, you know what I mean? Oh, I'm such an asshole. <laughs> so back good to stuff. <laughs> yeah, let's not. We all, yeah, we all have our own uh, shit, dude. Yeah. Obviously, Nobody you can tell. Nobody wants to be normal. Yeah. Nobody wants to be the guy who has holeless socks. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's my dog. That's a dog bite right there. I'm not. It's fine. It's totally. She eats my socks because it reminds about, her of this me. This isn't about you. <laughs> We're not cutting this out. No, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so where were we? All right, so when when you're in the Super Bowl. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> yep. Tell you about your art. Um, <laughs> all right, so what the hell were we talking about before I before Life I, is good. Okay, that's, that's what, good. Life that's is what good. I'm talking about. It is. Um, no, I, I I ended up with full custody of both of my kids. Um, it ended up that I got awarded child support for my daughter nonetheless <clears throat> which you don't see too many uh, not in Pennsylvania men getting child support right not that I've seen a dollar of it yet <laughs> but, <laughs> but I I did get awarded so we'll see what happens I mean your kids are beautiful dude like I even I mean the only interaction I really had with them was like what can I show you that isn't R-rated on the Apple TV <laughs> um but Uncle they, Marky, but, it's a good they, start. They, they, I mean, they were incredibly, in my quick two minutes with them, I mean, incredibly polite, funny. They are I mean, my you daughter. Got, you, I mean, you got two good kids, dude. I do. And now that's everything to me. I don't have anything else to worry about. That is what I do every day They're is your for them. Absolutely. Everything I do is for them, too. Um, my daughter does not have her mother at this point either. She's gone away. She got locked up for quite a few things, so we're waiting to see what happens with her. Um, so it's just me. It's me and them two. If you ever get on Tinder and somebody from named Nicole, hightailing it, yeah, gone. Yeah, you put your phone in a fireplace. Yes. 
Yes, I will not. So, have. I mean, what what can you? I mean, I and and I know this is probably not the forum to do it, but if um, I don't I don't think because the, because the addiction the opioid addiction right now is not you know I, I I always I try to tell people that it doesn't care what race you are it doesn't care what religion you are race, it doesn't care color, how much money religion, you make creed don't matter um you know and and it and it and it's everybody from you know CEOs down to I hate to say it but the homeless Demi I mean, Lovato was just on yeah how about mm-hmm. I mean that just happened and 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 for the people you think that are on the top of and on top of the world you know everybody's got demons mm-hmm. um. When I got when I got sober, I was very fortunate to realize that like, look, I have my mother, my father, my sister, and that's and that's all I need. I don't need my friends. I don't need, you know, acquaintances. I don't need people to like. I mean, I still need people to like me, but that's an ego thing. <laughs> and like the holes in your sock. <clears throat> well, I like you know what? I'd, I'd prefer friends who didn't judge me for the holes in the socks. <laughs> I didn't I, judge you. I don't like my feet being hot. It's like a vent. <laughs> um, you know, and and it, and, it, and it's if you have a good support system around you, man, it makes it a lot easier. Support's definitely huge. Um, my parents are probably and that too, doesn't, uh, but that doesn't mean people to coddle you or or any of that. It you know. No, I'm, but my other than my parents and my immediate family, they were huge. Like my parents are two of the best people you'd ever meet in your life. I mean, did they hate your fucking guts when you were using? And I wouldn't say hate your guts, but. I don't, you know what th- I mean? I don't think like- they hated my guts. I think they hated the fact that they knew something was wrong and they couldn't do anything to fix it. Yeah, but did they know? What, did they have any inclination of what it was? Yeah, they knew. They and, knew. and and it was was it like just like disappointment or was it? I I really think it was just it's my kid and he's suffering. Yeah. And I don't know what to do. I don't know what I can do. I don't know what to do. And. Because my parents hated my guts, and then, you know, my whole thing was I was going to lie to them, and I was going to say, um, you know, I have a problem, and I can't do anything about it, and I need help. And I and I planned on drinking within a week. And and the moment I said it, a switch went off, and I was like, holy shit, I think... <clears throat> I think my lie is true. <laughs> yeah, no, the same yeah. thing with me. I had to do the same thing. I had to take a pop of like pop a bunch of pills and then go to my father because my mother hated well, me. I didn't take anything. I was oh, I was I, I was in the midst of I a cocaine to. alcohol hangover but when I, I was like <laughs> I had to because I was just at I was I was beyond rock bottom. Like it was bad. That's the other thing too. Rock bottom's different for everybody. Mm-hmm. Everybody, everyone it has still their... hurts the same, but it's it's different for everybody. For some people, it's driving yeah. a, a car through a house. For other people, it's just disappointing everyone that loves you and um, I, I think it takes hitting rock bottom to before people realize that they do have a problem and that's the biggest thing is once you admit that you have a problem then you can go and get the help that you actually need and everybody and people came out from the woodwork man there were people who were honestly do you know who i was in a bar the night after i said the things that i said where i said i, I have a problem i can't do anything to fix it and I was in a bar in West Side. It was my, it's my favorite bar in the country. It's no longer what it is. But I walked in and I said, you know, I'm never drinking again. And if any of you see me try to drink, you have my permission to kick the shit out of me. And they were all like, well, we're in for that. Because <laughs> it's a West Side bar. <laughs> but my biggest supporters were drinkers. So I would go down there and, you know, at the time my cousin ran the bar and I called him up. I said, I'm going to, I said, I quit drinking, but I'm going to come down. And there was like a pause. And then he goes... I got this great orange soda, man. We just got it in. And I'm like, you're literally talking about actual orange soda. Oh, yeah, brother. Come on down. We got some good orange soda. So I went down there and I would just crush smokes and, you know, watch everybody. And and, and honestly, like not drinking alcohol from for, for eight years in a week or two. Yeah. The best thing I've found is to be around drunk people. <laughs> it is so much fun. Yeah, I'm around I drunk people, it. and I'm like, I don't fucking miss that at all. No, I know, but yeah. it's hysterical because you're like, did I ever really do anything that? Oh, the stuff yes, that I, I did, did is, I yeah, did. I don't even want to. God, Facebook wasn't around when we were when I was if drinking. If you go way, way back, you can find it. But MySpace, none of, none you're of my, MySpace. I've seen it. I had three MySpaces. <laughs> <laughs> I have a MySpace documentary at my house that I'm in. If you ever want to see it. Oh my um, God. So I mean, it, what what can you tell people? now after going with what you went through and you said in November that all this stuff is just going to poof 
November and, and you're of this back year, to being, it'll be all my my charges will be dismissed because I successfully completed. Um, and then I. But you're actively on, living a you're, you're you're actively living a good life. Oh yeah, it's awesome. I I couldn't ask for anything better. I I couldn't go on vacation when I was in addiction because I couldn't figure out how to get enough drugs on the plane to go with me. <laughs> oh. So finally, now that I'm done and I could leave, I have no problems. Um, August 9th in two weeks, me and the two kids are packing up. We're going to Disney for seven days. World or land? Florida. Disney World. Oh, oh, back to Florida. So yeah, back to Florida. <laughs> um, so when I lived in Orlando, I never went. But <laughs> I'm such a shit. I did. Aiden was there when he was young, like when he was first born. We took him, but not today. Next really year, you better bring him to Star Wars land, man. <laughs> Is that supposed to open? Next year. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'll but go with you. I'm, I'm down. <laughs> I'm a nerd. I'm, a, I'm excited to be able to go somewhere and not have to worry. Like, the best part of my day is when I wake up and I could just wake up and drink coffee and be semi-normal. Like, I don't have to go chase anything. I'm not finding anything. Is there a peace now there? Is there, like, a like almost a serenity? or Or is there... I mean, what do you... How would you describe August 31st, 2016? Hell. To, yeah. Compared to, <laughs> you know, today is the July 27th, 2017. I mean, what what do you We're feel during the day? <laughs> what did I say? 2017. You're, you're taking so my time, time machine off watch. <laughs> <laughs> you can edit that part. No, I'll keep it in. <laughs> I'm like Mr. Rogers, man. Even the mistakes stay. <laughs> no, it's it's completely different. And now there's no way that I would change what happened. Um, I'm actually so, you don't, so, so in a weird way, you don't regret all that. I don't. It, it made me a better person, and it made me a better father to my kids who actually need somebody to be there. Right. And I, I appreciate everything that everybody did for me through the process, mm -hmm. through treatment court, all of the people that are part of it, everything they did. Um, and it, it just, they're the one thing that I keep saying is there's light at the end of the tunnel. It's so much brighter and greener on this side, so to speak. And I don't, there's nothing I would change it for at this point. I mean, so how do you, so what would you say, I mean, <laughs> for people looking for help or for, you know, I mean, cause there's, this is a pandemic. This is a, this is a big problem it's a in this country and issue. no one's paying enough attention to it. It's a major problem. Every day that you open the paper, if you look in the obituaries every day, every other day, you see overdoses and it's this stuff that's out now is not the same as it used to be. They're cutting it with all this crazy stuff with fentanyl, with this car fentanyl now that's like an elephant tranquilizer. Like it's yeah, where you need like a, a, a like a one cc of it, and it's it's a, crippling. A match head of that car fentanyl is what they use to take an elephant down. So just wow. imagine what that'll do to a human body. And you don't have to imagine. Just open the paper and look in, in the obituary section, and you'll see what it's doing. To they, people. I saw you know I saw an interview. Um, <clears throat> Ohio has a really big problem. Like they, I mean, they have so many overdose deaths that they have to rent refrigerated trucks. I mean, it's terrible. I believe it. It's bad. And there was a bad batch of heroin going around. And I remember, I think it was NPR and, you know, they were interviewing, um, addicts and, and, and the addicts are, you know, they're like, you know, this is killing people. And the addicts are like, where do I find it? That's the thing. Again, you're so delusional and you're so out of it. If somebody dies, the first thing in your head is that's got to be good stuff. I want that. And that's what you'll go for. So, I mean, looking, I mean, you have, you have a great perspective on it as being, you know, once in active addiction and now, um, with your sobriety and, and staying clean and being a good and being a good human being, not to say that you weren't, you know, in addiction, um, that you weren't a bad person. You just did bad things. Um, how I mean how do you look at that as like insanity do you look at that as as being like it's like oh that's going to push you to like people are dying from this and you go I want to get that high people will do it and they're, I, I they're know gonna, they will they're going to continue it's just, to it's do just it. hard to convey that to, 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 to people who have never had addiction issues well, that's, to explain that's to them the what that is, means it, you see it and 
that's what you want because if it killed him, it's not going to kill me. It won't kill me. I'm, you know, he's. I, I that, mean, do you that, think you're a that guy's a That guy's a pussy. He can't handle his stuff. It <clears throat> right. won't do that to me. So I want what he had because it's got to be good. But the thing is, then they're doing it, and it is killing them, and it's killing a lot of people. And even people that are going to rehab, they're they're coming out, and they'll stay clean for thirty or sixty days, and they'll go back out. And they want to do the same amount that they were doing previous. Like if they were doing well, five bags, the tolerance, right? And then they don't have that tolerance, and they're taking those five again, and their body's not used to it, and it's lights out, right? Wow, <clears throat> did, did, have you have you lost friends? Have I lost friends? Well, don't look at me like I'm an asshole for asking <laughs> well, a question. No, because here, <laughs> here's the thing, though. When I was in addiction, I didn't have any friends i had associates that i dealt with but i didn't really have any friends everyone that i was friends with stopped talking to me because of what i was doing i mean best guess associates how many did you lose that o- I, over over that course of three years uh, i i don't even i can't put a number on it i don't know i mean is it that high no but there was probably a good 10 to 15 people that I seen on a daily basis that I don't have any association with whatsoever that I don't talk to. But but did any of them overdose and are now no, are no longer here? People that without, I was in, without naming names. People yeah, absolutely. People that I was in rehab with, um people that I went to a sober house for a little bit till I got my apartment cuz I couldn't get the kids back at that point. Um guys from there overdose. So yeah, there's a lot of people that I know that have overdosed but the the thing is there's help and there's places available that you can go to to get it and i don't know if people realize that they think that people are going to judge but it's, from my experience quite the opposite there's people that are willing to bend over backwards to give you what you need to get the help you need i wasn't going to say anything because i thought you were no i'm just Talking, <laughs> I am. <laughs> no, I mean, but but I but I bring but I but I, I bring up the fact that you lost people because be, we we can't deny the fact that this this is killing people. There's no denying that the fact that it's killing people that it's an epidemic and it's not pandemic pandemic yeah whatever you want to call it. It's not in California. It's not there. It is there as well, but it's right here also. Yeah, it's not mm-hmm. some. It's not. It's not some foreign land. It's in Northeast Pennsylvania, right Lackawanna right County, Lackawanna Scranton. County, Scranton. Absolutely. And out, and out in the two, sticks, two streets away from us, for that matter. You know what I mean? It's everywhere, and it's a problem. So, what's next for you? <clears throat> from here? Yeah. Um, when you're writing that book. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Wait. When are you gonna do that math problem that no one can solve? <laughs> When are you going to go over to France and run that CERN collider? <laughs> He's so smart. There's that. There's a funny commercial that um, I think it's a car insurance commercial. And it's like uh, Dr. whatever his name is was almost a genius, but he didn't buy his car on Carfax or whatever. <laughs> and he's got this huge math problem written on this board. Oh, I saw and that in the And he's up on the stairs and the guy comes yeah. and starts erasing his math problems. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and they're like, he was almost a genius. <laughs> Dr. Gunther or something. I forget his name, but yeah. So what's next? I mean, seriously, what's next? What, 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 what's, what's, I mean, do you, do you do one at a, one day at a time? Do you have short-term goals, goals, long-term goals? Like, what do you, what do you, what, I what's, do. what's I, the future hold for you, you amazing man? Well, I'm on a. <laughs> wearing red shorts. Nice. Yes. <laughs> and red shoes. Um, <clears throat> do you see my socks? I know. <laughs> <laughs> in all seriousness, no. dude, like, and it's on the microphone, so it's like, no, no, I, I mean, I mean, look, to be absolutely honest with you, we're we're we're, it's we're, we're laughing right now because because you're here, we dude, lived. you're here, we all lived, it, yeah, we're all you're here. You're an addict and you lived. I'm yep. an addict and I lived. He's an addict. So where's everybody else? Not here. Yeah, that's why we're laughing. Yes, right. You need to laugh in life. I, yeah, you need to find some. You need you you, you need to find. There was a lot of times I shouldn't have been here, so I'm definitely grateful <laughs> that I am. And you have still not answered my question. And, uh, <laughs> so for me, um, 
after graduation, you're on a six month tail until they dismiss your charges. So I'm finishing that. I have to see probation once a month, but after that, my charges get dis, uh, dismissed. And then I'm going for the expungement, which once they get expunged, then I can go back to doing what I liked before I started using, which is computers, electronics, which when I started using, I got completely away from. I didn't care about anymore. I right. didn't bother with it because the only thing that consumed my life was doing that. So I'd like to get back into that field once my charges are expunged. Have and, you been uh, dabbling uh, in the interim? You know, kind of like, because, I mean, technology moves so fast. You know, I've been playing around just seeing what I could do. Um, just a couple, for instances. I found online they keep posting these things for, like, you could play all your old NES games on this new system now. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, well, I'm just going to build my own. So I got parts and I built my own system. You, that, built, your own, you built your own NES? I did, but uh, mine's a little bit better though. I could play NES, Super Nintendo, Game Boy, everything up to PlayStation 1 I can play on mine. Are you shitting me? So, no, not at all. So I, I, I got back into it and um, that's the first big project that I set for myself that I ended up being able to finish. That's phenomenal. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I like it. And I bought two Super Nintendo style controllers uh -huh. with the R and L on top yeah. and the four. And uh, those are the two controllers you use to play. And then just map out the buttons for Sega. And yeah, but that's too, I mean, you do that with your kids, right? Just you guys sit there and just play Even old like as a Contra video game. Dude, that was the first game that I played when I started it. I was like, this is the whole reason I built was it. Was it up, up down, down, left, right, left, right? B A start. The Konami code. That's yeah. what started it. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, homie. Yeah, good stuff. Yeah. Um, the second big thing that I did was I was on Pinterest and I seen somebody that made, I know I love Pinterest by the way, you and every other lady in the country. <laughs> That's where I get all my cooking recipes. Yes, I am. <laughs> He's not kidding either. Are you cooking now? Oh yeah. That's, oh, another, that's, awesome. thing. that's another thing I picked up. I never cooked in my life. And oh, then I you're... started going on Pinterest and I'm like, wow, that looks good. I'm going to try and make it. I'm going to have you come down make me, make me cupcakes. Like, some of it comes out good. Some don't. If it looks good and I think I can do it, then I do it. Listen, a lot of the times it's about how it tastes, not how it looks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've seen some I've seen some bakery stuff where it's like oh my god and you're like it's delicious yeah well, I'm like I just gained five pounds looking at it never mind eating it um, but the other project that ingredients I did, add sugar <laughs> yeah, two pounds um, the other big thing that I did that I'm actually I think is pretty cool was I seen a guy that made they call them magic mirrors and it's basically a it's a mirror. And it's two-way reflexive glass with a monitor behind it. That's a information display board. Um, on my end, I put a sports feed from Sports Center. Um, it has the weather for the next five days. It has my calendar, which is my Google Calendar, which is linked to my phone. So anything I add to my calendar on my phone pops up on that screen. Wait, could you put that in my house? Absolutely. <laughs> I, right, Scooby. I, told, I told her I made one, and she's like, Marky would love that. We need to talk to him. I did. He sent me a picture of it. I, I'm supposed yeah, to show you. Yeah, but why'd you say it that way? Marky would love that. You should show it to him. Because she said you like stuff like that. Yeah. Oh, anything yeah. that well, makes my house clearly, look like... Clearly, I, I was right. Anything that makes my house look more like Demolition Man with Sylvester Stallone, I am there. And now I just got to figure out the three seashells, and then we're good. Oh, my God. But, but yeah. I, I will I, hire you. I, I seen it and I'm like, you know what? I could do it. And in addiction, I wouldn't have even tried it. I'd been like, nah, there ain't no, no like possible your creativity's way. coming out. Like all this, like it a, is, it's, it, it's coming back. And like, I like to do stuff like that. Like I, I was the type of person that would, when my parents bought our, um, us, our first computer, you know, I ripped it apart to see what made it tick. Like that's, <laughs> that's the type of person I am. But I, I got away it. from that. I, I, I did when I was in addiction, I didn't care about it. But now, All your passions went away. Yeah, but now I have that drive again, and I, I, I like doing it. I mean, do you, do you think, um, for anybody out there, that anybody who thinks that there is no hope, do you think that that's true? No, there's, there's definitely hope without a doubt. Um, you just have to want it. It's actually something that you want have to want for yourself. And if you do, there's every avenue available to get help and, and do the right thing. Besides yourself, who do you um, credit with your with maintaining sobriety and happiness? 
the the support system that I have now, um, without a doubt, my parents, they are two of the biggest supporters. Um, my immediate family is always there. Uh, my sponsor and a lot of the people that I went through treatment court with, I still talk to because they were in the same boat. We're all in the same boat. We're going through it together. We're still right. in it together. So a lot of them are still there as well. How about how about the the you know the local law enforcement and the and the programs that they have? I mean, do the, I mean do they deserve a lot of credit or? You know, when when they arrested me, they were assholes. They were the biggest jerk offs in the world. I could call them every curse word, but they just did their job, which in the end saved my life. So now. I really can't say anything bad about him because I actually have appreciation for what happened, gratitude for that day. So even so, though at the time you were like, I hate all, you're all scumbag. Uh, now, you're, yeah, now you're looking I, back and you're like, but I mean, that's, I mean, that probably happened with, with mom and dad too. I mean, at some point you were like, you know, go fuck yourself, you know, cause we've all done it. You don't understand me. You don't care about me. Fuck you. Why won't you give me $20? When they were sending children and youth to my house, absolutely. I was like, how can my own parents do that to me? But in hindsight, I mean, you look but at it understanding and understanding like, now and looking back, yeah, they were trying to help whatever way they could figure out. So I don't, there's no ill will. I don't have any towards them. I mean, I don't know what they're, I'm sure they don't towards me, but, you know, what happened? I mean, do you, I mean, do you, I started telling my parents I love them more. <laughs> I used to never do that. They were like, we love you. And I'm like, mm-hmm. <laughs> and now I'm like, I did that too. And now I'm like, mm-hmm. you know, cause, because I, you know, I didn't do the steps. I didn't do any of that stuff, but you know, a couple of them, a couple of the steps I'm like, you know, atone, you know, go back and, you know, make amends. <clears throat> make amends. Um, and I realized like a lot of the stuff that I put them through, you know, at the time they would give me shit about it. And I'm like, well, you don't like, you know, you try to control me and tell me what to, and it's like, no, they love you. Yeah. You know, they're trying to, they're trying to make sure that, you know, you survive. You're getting what's best. You're their children. Yeah. They want mm-hmm. like every parent wants better for their kids than they had. It, yep. You know, and they, and, and, you know, s- something happened recently where I forget, I forget what happened. And I, I remember looking at my fiance, Victoria, and I was, I was like, you know, I don't, I, I'll never, Oh, my, my net, I think it was something to do with my nephew. And I said, you know, I never really understood a parent. And it's not even my kid, but I never understood like a parent's love and how you can't explain it until like he was born. Mm -hmm. It was like, it was, it was transformative for me emotionally. Um, but that's, you know, that's another podcast where I'm on the couch and you guys ask me questions. <laughs> yes. Like Freud. Because then we'll be the parents since we are. And, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, is but there anything it, else you want to Everything that I do now is for. <clears throat> those two beautiful the kids. The two yeah. that are sitting out in the room now. You finally find, you, you finally find something that you love more than yourself. But it was there the whole time. It was, but you have to see it first. Like, because you know, everything is with about clarity, you, 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 have to you. See it. Yeah. I know I was the most selfish person ever. Maybe I still am. Who knows? I didn't want to tell you. Well, that's what this show's for, right? I'm on the couch. I got no comment. I'm just going to act like I didn't hear it. <laughs> um, I'm incredibly proud of you. Me too. Thank you. Um, I'm incredibly proud of what you accomplish. I'm incredibly proud that that people who even aren't your family helped you. I'm incredibly proud that your family stuck by you. Um, and uh, I'm incredibly proud that I wore one holy sock <laughs> today to embarrass myself in front of possibly thousands of people. Because c'est la vie. This isn't about you. It always turns into it. Um, <laughs> you want to come back and talk to us after uh, after graduation and then or after the expungement and then, you know, see how see how you're doing. You know, because I think there's a lot of people that uh, they have some questions or like follow up. Yeah, or maybe, maybe anybody who has know. any questions or, or stuff right now, you know, can can hit us up. Um, and I don't I don't want to give out your information, but maybe they can message us on the on Facebook or yep. email or twenty five eight studio whatever, and we'll and maybe we can direct them to the right place and absolutely we have the crazies <laughs> and, and and realize that there is no such thing as no hope. Truth.
you know, it's, 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 it's a long road, but if you, if it's something you truly want, it can be accomplished and it could be done. If I could do it, then anybody could do it. I was as bad, if not worse than some people, some people are probably worse than me, but the bottom line is it definitely can be done. I'm so happy I met you. Yeah. I appreciate you having me on too. Yeah. It's good stuff. You were supposed to say you're happy you met me because it's about me. I am me. happy. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Right, great. <laughs> and I'm happy right. I got to see. The holy socks. Holy <laughs> socks yeah. that are not worn on a Sunday. <laughs> there's no so- There's can no. You do, can you just, I'm going to pot the feel of the I'm going to pot the feel of the song. <laughs> if it's going to be holy. All right. It better be a sock. <laughs> Everybody have a great week. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>